today to Gubby Gubby people, or Cubby Cubby people, and pay respects to elders past, present, and emerging. I'd also like to take a minute to acknowledge the passing of my Queen Elizabeth II, who had the respect and admiration of many in our shire. Flags outside the council chambers here at Toronto and flying at half mast. And at Thursday's ordinary meeting, the, the mayor will be um, passing a mayoral minute, uh, which will contain the formal condolences of this council. Uh, may we have a confirmation of the minutes from the general committee meeting held on 15th of August? Um, Councillor Lawrenson, have a seconder, please. Councillor Stewart, all in favour? Carried. We have no presentations, we have no deputations, and we have some items referred from committees. The first being the application for material change of use for an office at 2 Emerald Street, Karoi. And we have Nadine back here. Nadine, uh, for those who have come in late, to talk about the, um, the, uh, the application of the development. Certainly. And also some of the changes uh, which are reflected in a suggested um, recommendation. Um, this application is for a material change of use for a two-storey office building out at number two Emerald Street, uh, Karoi. The site has frontage to both Emerald Street and to Women's Lane at the rear. The two-storey building um, was considered to be consistent with the character, um, uh, presenting a parapet to Emerald Street, which reflects sort of the existing character to the east. Um, and there was a small height encroachment of about half a metre due to that parapet. The proposal uh, didn't comply uh, in with height, but also didn't comply with car parking requirements. However, due to a dedication of two metres to the Wimmers Laneway, which is required by Council, and also a uh, pathway, a cycle and pedestrian pathway for the full length of the eastern side of the site, uh, which is indicated in Council's planning scheme, that reduced car parking rate was considered acceptable by staff. The application was referred to the committee meeting at um, the request of Councillor Stockwell, because uh, there were some issues with the, uh, the design of the building. Uh, in discussions with um, Councillor Stockwell, the, there were concerns in terms of the parapet presentation to the street, um, as well as the, um, the street awning, and the presentation of that street awning and no posts. So a alternative motion has been put up in terms of requesting removal of the parapet and the installation of a hip route to the street and as well as a, a slope on the street awning and the provision of posts. Mm. Um, now, councillors, we have staff here for questions and that's questions to elicit information only and I respectfully request you Hold back your commentary for formal debate, please. So, does anyone have any formal questions of staff to elicit information? Joe. With regard to the parapet, I went up and had a look at mm. uh, at Karoi, had another good look at Karoi, and I noticed that parapets are the exception rather than the rule in Karoi. Mm. They tend to be more, um, I don't know what to describe it, but you know, with, with posts coming into the into the ground in the uh, in the public space. Um, is there no, and that was based on Council Stockwell's comments, is there no provision in the planning scheme to, uh, to have that as the standard in Karoi? Uh, the, the locality plan, um, the locality plan talks about development being consistent with the, the character of the street. So definitely uh, staff looked at this site and to the area directly to the east and that was all parapets and that was all awnings without posts. So when you look at that side, there is definitely that character which this building has reflected and which the um, applicant looked at the character and that's what they surmised it was as well. Uh, when you look opposite, yes, there's a different character. There's uh, the traditional or more traditional uh, pitch roof and awnings with posts and plus a, a range of other interpretations on that on the opposite side, as you can see. Um, with Street View there, so I don't agree. I, I believe the. Um, Excuse me, you delay yourself. I'm just just questioning the, the comment coming back. That the, 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 well, the, there are. Could you I'm not question the comment? I'm, I'm, I'm confirming you. the response, Frank. Okay, I'm Can just, I confirm I, the response? Okay, I'd like to speak here at this moment. Um, there's concern being raised that councillors are debating the advice given by staff. And I respectfully again request that we do not do that and we use question time to elicit information 
not debating. I'm not opinions. debating, Frank. I'm confirming the response. You the information given, you I don't agree with. Okay. And I'm just confirming that whether that's correct or not. All right, well, I don't think staff need to hear that you don't agree with the advice when, during question, when you're questioning the staff, please go. They're here to give their opinion. They give it. We don't need to give. You can save your opinions. Or it's not an opinion, place. Frank. I'm asking a question in relation to the response that I just got. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, That's I do. Fine. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'll see whether you understood what I said or not. Yes. Well, if I can ask the question, if I can ask the question. May I ask a question, Thank you. Thank you. If you can say the commentary. It's not commentary, Frank. I've got a question. With regard to what you've just said, I see a parapet on the property next door, but on the the adjoining property, there's only three properties, uh, two properties beside there. One one is the um, the Jell Ignite Jacks two dollar shop that has a parapet. The one next door is Jamaica Blue, which has an awning at the front and posts to the street. Beyond that is the um, the brick um, old uh, building. So. I'm not sure about Jamaica Blue. I know you've, you've posted some fa photos. As th that is parapet because with that awning at the front, you don't see that. You see posts. Uh, are you, the parapet, yes. The parapet is the uh, the structure. So it's but it's a that's suspended a flat parapet. structure. A parapet is um, in my report. If you can, maybe I've got. A parapet is a structure that comes up and screens the roof. Yes. Thank you. You can't see the roof. Sorry, okay, so yes, the or, so okay, that, sorry, awning, that's, awning. That's what we call the parapet. That parapet, yeah, sorry, I'm, okay. I'm referring to the awning. Sorry, I should be referring to the awning rather than the parapet. The parapet I've got no issue with. It's the, 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 the suspended awnings as opposed to um, posts in the ground like there is on the other side. Um, I said it's very difficult to tell that with the Jamaica Blue property. Is that the case with the Jamaica Blue property as well? I thought it had posts. So I'm saying the only building that I can see that does that has an awning is the Jetting Light Jacks building, which is beside it. Every other building in the street that I can see has has posts. Has posts. Uh, so there's the Jelly Night Jacks and there is also the little shop next to it as I well. I did miss the little yeah. shop, yes. I, I thought yes. it was one and the same, sorry. Yes, so there are some posts up in front of the Jamaica Blue. So in reference to the entire street, there's only one other prop <laughs> there's only those adjoining properties that have on on the uh, on, on, that, on that side yeah. on, the on the southern but side, but on the street as a whole, on the other side, on the northern you take side, the street as a whole. Yes, the majority of the street has posts. Has posts. That's Thank correct. You. That's all I wanted to clarify. Thank you. That was the clarification I was after. Thank you. Um, what? Councillor Morrison. Uh, my question, um, Dean, is that this application is code accessible, which means it's assessed against the. Call law and local plan, district, centre zone code, business activities code, works code. That's correct. Um, the application assessed against those benchmarks, does it comply without this additional requirement? No. Uh, my original report, I'd indicated that I believed it did comply with the character of the street yeah. and was that it, it, it was acceptable. Um, so that was my interpretation that yes, it did comply. The additional um, or the proposed additional condition, um, will that have any financial implications? Um, is it reasonable in your opinion um, and would the applicant incur any increase in costs? Yes, I, I would assume they would. Um, I have spoken to the applicant about it yeah. and um, they would prefer not to change it. They are ready to proceed. They mm. are very keen to start construction on the building. So they've indicated they. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. sorry, that they uh, so they <coughs> wouldn't they, they don't prefer to change uh, the the proposal. They thought they had uh, designed something that was consistent with the streetscape and reflective of the character. Um, so they're not they're not keen to change. I don't know if they've gone too far in terms of their process, but yes, it would require. The sloping of the awning will require some changes to the upper level balcony. I don't know that the removal of, I'm not quite sure what the removal of the parapet will do, um, but there would be more design changes uh, that would be required to be uh, adjusted and that will cause some additional costs to them. Excuse me, but then regarding the parapet, the parapets that are on the other properties in the street, do they exceed the eight metre height? No, they're all single storey buildings. Okay, thank you. So I just had a clarification. Um, under the Act, we can't consider the personal financial circumstances of the applicant. Would 
considering um, whether there's additional cost flow under that, or is that a, a, a permissible consideration? It, it's not a relevant consideration under the Planning Act. Um, but it, it's relevant for us to consider that, you know, officers are saying that it's a proposal that complies. Um, I think that's the point. And, and can I ask um, that if it was challenged, would a court in past experiences some, would consider additional cost or reasonableness of a new cause as having um, any influence? Would they consider that as important? The court is bound by the same rules as we are under the Planning Act, that we can't give consideration to a person's personal financial circumstances. Okay. Anyone care to move a recommendation? Councillor I'll move a alternate motion. Uh, I think Cathy's just bringing it up. Not the requested one. The one that I said. No. Um, and that's council note the further report by the development planner to the general committee meeting dated 12th of September 2012. And the report to the planning environment committee dated 6th of September 2022 regarding application MCUs. 2262 for a development permit for a material change use for officers situated to Emerald Street Colloid. And A, vary the recommendation from the recommendation of staff on the basis that the staff assessment has placed in adequate weight on the need for development to contribute to the achievement of A, the district centre zone overall outcomes 2G and H. B, the Crawley local performance outcomes PO3, PO7 and P10. The staff assessment has placed too much weight on the stand on the standard and design of existing nearby development fair to the desired future character clearly outlined in the plan. B, does not agree to the proposed relaxation of height and car parking requirements due to the failure of the design to meet the outcomes listed above. And C, advise the applicant that council would consider relaxation of height requirements should that one, the second storey parapet be removed and replaced with a hip roof design to reflect the traditional character of two storey buildings in the business district. And two, that the council leave an awning be replaced with a street awning that generally reflects the design criteria outlined in figure 6.4.2.4, pedestrian environment street awnings in Croy and Hindley. I'll, I'll, I'll second it for the sake of argument. Thank you, Joe. I'll talk to it, I'll talk to it with graphics if I can, please, Cathy. So, The performance outcomes are fairly clear. The performance outcomes in the NUSA Plan 2020 reflect 30 years of planning. Um, the grounds I've talked about is, I'm going to outline what they say and use pictures to exemplify them. The, the grounds that staff have come from, if you look at Emerald Street, it, it, it is a quite a varied street environment. I'm not arguing with that. What I'm arguing with is, uh, for 30 years, we've tried to improve that every chance we've got that when particularly when I've been in this building. So PO7 says building structures and landscaping are consistent with and reflective of the traditional town country Croy in terms of form. And as we find out, there is no second story parapets in Croy. Materials, uh, obviously Croy features a lot of timber. Uh, um, proportion, composition and materials, okay? So next, please, Cathy. Um, P10 says development in the district centre zone is sympathetic to the Croy town character and the identity of Croy. And you can see there that you've got um, some old 1930s with all with street verandas with the timber posts. And in general, if you look at the one on the left, uh, there's sloping roofs or, and the parapets are all on the first storey. Uh, next please. And that's what I believe are some of the key attributes of P10. In the 70s and 80s, you can see that the street, the top right hand corner, um, looked a fair bit different to where it does now. And that's a result of specific advocacy by the community and value placed on the heritage. You can see the top left hand side there, an old Croy Rag article talking about how to improve the heritage of the street. And then one of the first buildings that tried to reflect that, uh, which is in Emerald, London Emerald Street, in Garnet Street, with the uh, they're the, the, looking at the verandas and the bull notes. So it has been this process, it's been both a, a, a community process and a council process, but a planning process. You see on the left there, there was you know, a streetscape that we could use if it was there now. We could argue you don't need to do anything on, about it because the, 
the, the, the, the existing development doesn't have all the things that the planning scheme says it needs to. And next, um, and 2H talks about development reinforces a traditional Main Street character can scale of development in the centre. And you can see that there's not much difference um, between the, the 80s and now. The, the new buildings on the right, uh, you can see that with the, the, a few pitches to the roof, they were built straight after the, the, the Croy character was defined in the planning scheme or the development control plan came out and the owner, I think, was Fred Burwell, who did a couple of nice little things. And you probably can't tell the difference between the modern development and the historic development in that end of the street. And I think that's where we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to the new development just looks like it's been there for a while. If we go next, if we look at second story treatments, um, <coughs> there's one of the old Croy hotels. This development has a high level of architectural merit and contributes positively to the activation of the street and the character of the centre. And to me, the design doesn't do that. To me, the design has mismatch of some elements of character, but certainly we don't have the cantilevered awnings as part of the Croy character, and we don't have the second story parapets. We do have some features, which, you know, one of the reasons that commercial development do like parapets is for the signage. Um, but you see the old Croy Hotel there, there's another treatment that may, may work, or as the motion says, the hip roof. So to me, each step we get, we should be trying to build the Croy country town character. Um, the motion and the, what we're, I su I'm suggesting is not a major change to development, it's about trying to make it reflect. And if we go next, I think it might be the last one. Uh, PO3 starts building structures and landscaping are consistent with the reflected of traditional country town character of Croy in terms of done that way. If you look right next door is an old church reno. Okay, so we've got pictures of all the things that don't comply. We haven't got pictures of how other people are actually doing their best to reflect Croy town character. And I think most importantly is we're pretty specific about what we want. And that street veranda gives exactly what we want in this development. And that's what my motion suggests. And that might be something that they can agree to before Thursday and we can go ahead and approve it and they won't hold up their timelines at all. Question for Councillor Stockwell. Is, does any of the um, illustrations you've provided have included an example of a hip roof design. Oh, oh. so go back, whether we can see a hip roof design, I think probably the, the very first one of the Victory Hotel is a hip roof design. That one? Yeah, well, mm -hmm. sort of, because it goes around the corner, it's a bit more complex. So hip roof's just that way. Hip's almost like a pyramid, thank you. Okay. The gable is the... The gable is a flat triangle, mm -hmm. yes. and then the hip is, you know, like your traditional Queensland, like a pyramid. Okay. So that that would be that end. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I just think it's something that, with my amendment, you can um, start set, well, continue on uh, the good work that's been done by other developers and start getting Emerald Street um, as nice and uh, with a with an interaction with the public space uh, like we have got. And it hasn't been um, by, yeah, it's been by one development at a time in the Maple Street, and we can do the same thing in Emerald Street. Um, I have a question. Councillor uh, Stockwell, you ma mentioned the development control plan in Karoi that spoke to development. What, do you know what year that was? Um, can I give you a. Yeah, uh, round about. 89 to 91. Yeah. 89 so, to 91. Yeah. And. and followed up by a set of design guidelines which was done as a planning study leading up to the 2006 planning scheme. Okay. Um, and through the chair to the staff, is anyone able to tell me around what year the IGA development went into Emerald Street? The, the old one? The one that's been provided on the opposite side. The opposite side. Um, I think probably around 2007, yeah. 2010. Well, 2007 to 10. So the photograph provided in our notes, um, if you look at the front of the IGA there, how does that align then with this development control plan, Councillor Stockwell? I'm just trying to like find out like your argument. I mean, I look, I'm not saying that every development since then has complied and it was in the Sunshine Coast Council era. I won't go any further. Um, I'm just saying that it has been a, 
a, a planning outcome sought since that time. And the plan 2020 clearly identifies that within the development codes. The, 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 what we have to wait up um, in this question is how much we put on the existing surrounding development that doesn't comply with the planning uh, guidelines or the planning, uh, uh, I suppose, outcome sought since uh, either late 80s or early 90s, uh, and how much we place on uh, trying to get it to the aspiration that we've outlined for the community in this plan. Oh. Well, you, you say that you're um, you're putting weight on the overall outcome two G and H and the Crowley local plan performance outcome. Do you have do you, do you have those up on the screen for us? Um, I would if my I brought my pad off on it today. <laughs> so so um, to the district. If, if you keep going, I'll be able to find where I where I am. It's probably the, the one you want to look at is um, PO10. Can we bring up PO10, Kathy? Just while Kathy's looking for this for us, um, I think it's important to understand this is a code of specifications. So I'm a little bit concerned about the motion as is. Just if we do not decide this matter by Thursday, it will go deemed approved. Um, so the motion doesn't really make a decision on the matter. So we actually need to either come up with a refusal, an approval, or a conditioned approval. Um, so if we want to change the character and built form, I would encourage councillors to think about adding in the conditions that staff have drafted in the further report. Because um, the current motion just lets it sit on the table and makes no decision. Sorry, yeah, when I wrote that, I was thinking it was an MGU, so. Yeah. So if we, if we want to check, just to go back through that, we, the current motion, we need to make a decision by this Thursday. Yeah. So it needs to either be an approval, as staff have recommended, um, a refusal, which we can write, or an approval with additional conditions. Now, staff have drafted additional conditions based on Councillor Stockwell's request for some design changes. You just need to add those in to the motion. So just to clarify, Kerry is saying if we dispense with this one because it's not prescriptive in terms of matching for the local government, and then we could someone could move the staff recommendation which incorporates the suggested yes. changes yes. or another motion. That's right. So the staff have a clear direction about this. Yeah. We need to make a decision decision by this Thursday. Right. Just, just a question. Um, sorry, the just what we have in front of us, which is the further report with the additional conditions on page ten. They're the conditions that were discussed last week and included, and the ones that you're talking about that, so they've already been included. Yes. Yes. So they're the ones that they're, you've spoken to the applicant about. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. For the sake of expediting things, I'll speak to the motion. Um, for the reasons just stated, um, that we need a prescriptive and key direction for staff. I'll, I won't be supporting this motion, and um, I urge councillors also to not support it so we can uh, discuss a motion that will give more clear direction for the staff. Anyone else wish to speak to the motion? Councillor Stockton, just to close. Well, no. well uh, just well, to Tom. I, I, obviously, I'll speak to the motion. Uh, I spend a lot of time on the street and envision the building, put it up, and I I, I, I think it fits with, I, I, I don't agree with the aesthetics uh, that uh, of the motion and Councillor Stockwell. I think the, the aesthetics are fine, and they actually do reflect uh, the, the, the feel of Croy, especially the buildings next to it. It's just a different era, but Croy is an old town. It has different eras. We don't want to go back to, we'd love to go back to the old wood era and back to the old hotels, but we can't. But next door we have Jell and Night Jacks and we have the Coyote and the other buildings that, that actually have that sort of post art deco look and uh, they're very functional. And so it, yeah, I don't see any any legal reason uh, to, to go to support this and I don't see any aesthetic reason to support it. Thank you, Phil. Any other councillors wish to speak to the motion? I will, I will, I will close this because I found the 2, 2G and 2H for you, Councillor Winger. It's, uh, it's 2G is development has a high level of architectural merit and contributes positively to the activation of the street and the character of the centre. Uh, 2H development reinforces the traditional, traditional, traditional uh, main street character, not the uh, you see, character, uh, what the traditional main street character and scale of development in the centre. 
Um, but closing, yeah, when I wrote that motion, I was thinking of the need for material change use, so I'm happy to have a, a alternate motion that has it as a condition of approval. Put a motion that's in favour. No one uh, against. That's unanimous. Um, someone can move. Uh, I'm going to go back to the staff recommendation. Staff alternate. No, the, the, the alternative that staff provided in result to the my request. The requested motion. Yes. Move for Councillor Stockwell. And I'll second it. Second it, Councillor Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Sorry. Thank you, Wilkabus. <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't speak any more um, other than to say that um, it, I think this is something that could be easily done. I do think uh, being co accessible uh, that we can rely on the grounds uh, for asking for this change for the reasons I outlined before in terms of meeting the performance outcomes, um, particularly since the staff recommendation um, uh, doesn't uh, acknowledge, well, to my opinion, um, it relies on a, a overall outcome rather than meeting the performance outcome with respect to the street awning. Uh, be really mindful of that, that the staff suggested that the, the street awning. Um, it acknowledges that it doesn't meet that relevant performance outcome. Um, I think that's a very minor change that uh, is something that we've been doing in Croy for, for a long time. It is uh, requesting that they, they go to a um, an awning that is not um, cantilevered, that is supported by wooden posts, and we have the diagram in the planning scheme to ask for it. Is that is that accurate? Was that was that a mistake, or was it just a different interpretation? I, I don't, um, it, it get, sorry, I don't, I don't want to debate. You're right. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit of only that it's a bit of an unfair. Yeah, question. you're not a mistake. When, yeah, exactly. when we are in debate, Tom. Yeah. Uh, I want to speak in favour of, of the motion mainly because um, other uh, businesses in the town have gone to the trouble of putting in applications that do comply and do abide by the character aspirations of the town without exceeding the height limit. Uh, I would be perfectly in favour of a design that included a parapet and other nods to um, traditional designs if they didn't exceed the height limit as other parapet um, adorned um, buildings in the street do. Um, I think a hip roof design will ensure that the, the building um, is complies with the height limit, which is, um, news is pretty strong on the height of buildings across the Shire. And the reason for that is we want all development to be considered human scale and not overshadow the streets or be too imposing. So for that reason, I'm willing to support this, um, this motion. Um, and if they can incorporate a parapet in the design that brings the building design in under eight, uh, at eight metres, I would support that as well. But the hip roof design seems to be the, um, the easiest solution at this point. Is it, uh, question eight. Is it normal for, for, count, for the councillors to, to come back and make such a... It's, it's, it's a substantial change going from the flat roof to a, to a pointed roof, I would suspect, and taking away the parapet. Um, is that... Um, uh, I think it's a bit of an unfair question. Can I just, can I just okay. clarify something that was yes, said there? Yeah. Um, my understanding is it's not a flat roof design. It is a pitched roof design. Yes, it is. Behind the parapet, it is yeah. a... It's a just that it doesn't have a, a gable. It doesn't uh, have it, the it's hip. A, it's a gable in, so yes. hip, hip, hip in at the front. So yes. just to clarify that. Yeah. And just on that, I have noticed um, that uh, condition 14 would also have to be amended. Um, because uh, I've referred that I've kept the original condition in, uh, which relates to the height of the parapet, uh, must not exceed RL uh, 118. I'll have to amend so that. It's changed from the original 14. Must not exceed 8 metres? Yes, must not exceed 8 metres. Uh, so, yeah, the maximum height of the development must so not exceed the 8 metres. And actually, 8 metres? Yeah, and you could probably delete the rest to the peak of the roof line. Um, this has been moved and seconded. Oh, sorry. No, no, no can't we can take amend it. If the, whole, if the, Council if the whole committee whole. agree. Mm. So the purpose of this amendment is to ensure that if this is approved, the building height will not exceed, exceed eight, eight metres as it 
would with the parameters. That's correct, yes. And the only reason for this change here in point 14 is the okay. fact that it was just an, o an oversight, oversight with, the, that was with, the, with, the, yes. with the changes proposed by council. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. So oh. would you consider it a technical amendment? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm. No, is it? Well, I just have a quick a question. Um, given the applicant agreed to improvements in the cycle walking strategy down the, the lane, um, will the applicant now have opportunity to withdraw from that agreement if they're now making, you know, having to comply to another? Set of rules, what I'm basically. Going to do, Karen, is we'll just deal with if we've got councillor consent for that technical change to this motion that we've got before us, then we'll have staff answer your question if that's all right. So if we deal with the issue of your councillors by show of hands show that they're okay with that technical amendment for the purpose of the debate. Thank you, Karen. Well, that is my question. If we're now seeking to change what was initially in the report, we haven't got the applicant at the table with us. Is the applicant then able to withdraw from the agreement to do the upgrades or comply to the um, work being done in the laneway at the back? Will this affect the work in the laneway? Is that what you're saying? Karen? Well, there was an agreement negotiated that the height, I could have it wrong, that the height was negotiated in relation to the... Um, what was it, the cycle strategy the cycle at strategy. the back? Mm -hmm. Their whole proposal is based around the provision of that cycle that's, way. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. I, I don't, yes, the whole design is based with that cycle way uh, and with that dedication at the back. Uh, I believe it, it was never purported to be a, a, a trade-off. Yeah, we, we accepted it on the basis that, uh, you know, there were these other areas of non-compliance. Uh, but I don't believe it was a trade-off, no. I think the clarification, there was a trade-off though in suggesting we may uh, accept to reduce car parking because of the dedication. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, of the dedication, yes, not so much the height, yes. One would think that that dedication in reducing the, the space available for car parking was a fair compromise to acknowledging you, you're losing car parking space because we've absolutely. actually taken up space where car parking could go. That's correct, absolutely. Okay. Another question. Um, if we, these changes are agreed to uh, at this table, uh, what would be the process? I mean, there's significant design changes. Do you have any idea about the time frame, the extension of time it would in, that the applicant would incur to have bring back change in design? Uh, with these, these would be conditioned, uh, so they would have to provide a design to us uh, prior to operational works or building works being issued. So it, the, the resolution and the conditions are not worded that those design changes would come back to council. Okay. So it would be... Uh, but they would incur that time. They maybe. would incur. Yeah. Yeah. My understanding is they would do them yeah. pretty quickly. Okay. Yeah. So essentially if you're giving them the approval to go ahead and do it, then according And they'll do it. They'll do it straight away. Okay. Motion. <coughs> yeah, look, I'll speak just with this. Um, look, I, I must admit, initially, I was puzzled by um, uh, what Councillor Sopper would raise, uh, raise in relation, in particular, in relation to parapets, because I knew parapets were quite prominent, uh, particularly down. Um, uh, I forgot the street name. Maple. Uh, thank you, Maple Street. <laughs> Maple Walk, uh, particularly down Maple Street. Uh, but what, since he's pointed out uh, in that, uh, that two-storey uh, uh, arrangement, I see the point that he's trying to raise and the character elements that, uh, that he's referring to, and particularly when I uh, walked around Karoy again and went, hang on, you, there is a point that he raises, and, uh, and the number of posts that, uh, that uh, support the awnings are in a character element throughout Maple Street in particular and along, uh, along the street as well. So. Uh, I see the points that he raises. I think they're, uh, they're fairly legitimate points to character within the Karoi precinct, and uh, I'm happy to support the changes. Uh, anyone else wish to speak before Councillor Stockwell closes? Well, Tom? I, I would, I, I'm very satisfied with the original uh, approval. That uh, I, I don't think posts are, are important. Uh, I, I, I think that that the height adjustment is, is slight, and I think that it, that is the, the parapet on the top of the building really does fit with the Croy streetscape. And the lack of posts 
is consistent with the, 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 the second version of Croy Streetscape as well. So I, I'm very satisfied that the, the, the original um, application was fine. So I, I, don't, I don't think these are improvements. Councillor Stockwell, you have to close. Oh, only to reinforce that the, the outcomes sought from this planning scheme are the same as being presented years, and that's for the traditional character of Croy, uh, which is strongly those with the street verandas with wooden posts. Um, and I think that is uh, as required in the planning scheme. There is no not sufficient merit within the alternative design to warrant not achieving the performance outcomes in the code assessment application. Um, to go to the next level, which is an overall outcome, I don't think it's warranted in this case, hence the motion. Thank you. Put the motion those in favour. So we might be we're voting so on the, 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 the second. Motion. Okay. Yes. And if we don't vote for this, then it goes back to the original motion? or If it's lost, Tom, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, Amelia, uh, Joe, Karen, Claire, Brian, Frank, against uh, Tom. That means the motion's carried. Next item. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just clarifying the minutes there. I'm seeing four and against him. That's all right. That's right. Clar that's right. Just Thank want to clarify you. that before we move on. Thank you, Ken. Good point. Thank you, Ken. Uh, application to reconfigure a lot. One lot and two lots of 21 Jerome and Crescent. Is that the next one? And that is um, from the oh. Environment Committee. Yeah, that's no, no, no. Uh, it's page 63. It's, it's Annie Creek Road, Nooseville. Do you remember, it's not item number two? You, you did number three before. Yeah. You, number one was referred, referred it's, to item three. Yeah, it's page 22 of the Planning Environment Committee yeah. meeting agenda. Yeah, but we're on the General Committee agenda. We're on the General agenda, Committee, and general committee agenda is the next point, next uh, yeah. item it's is 66 item number two. Oh. It's 66 Seaview Terrace in my agenda. Yeah. No, it's not. It's Amy no, no, Creek Road. It's MCU two one zero. Oh, sorry. Here, yeah, right. sorry, I'm in the wrong. Sturma. Sorry, Sturma. Sturma. That's, that's right. 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 There we go. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> I must have a different agenda. I'm sorry. Page twenty two. Page twenty two. Planning agenda. Planning agenda. Planning agenda. Planning agenda. General committee agenda. And the next item four. But look at number one. You're looking at number three. We're number. We're item two. We did one and three together. Got no, it's in the oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. I see. Okay. Sorry, that because they were reports to the general committee. Sorry. My apologies. That's all right. <laughs> My apologies. So that means we've got to go back to the services. Yeah. Kind of planning. Hello, Patrick. Um, for those just, <laughs> that's what happens when you don't yeah, actually put the things yeah. in the bloody agenda. Well, for the benefit yeah. of us all, could you um, refresh, yep. refresh us all on okay. the application that's before us here at General Board? Presence. Okay, so um, we did some discussion around this one at the Planning Environment Committee meeting relating to 21 Jura Crescent Croba. It's a reconfiguration of the site from one lot into two lot. Uh, it's proposed to uh, create the new lot essentially to the rear of, of the site uh, with an axement, ac existing ac access easement to provide access through to that rear lot. Um, there are a few issues uh, with this one. Um, something that we probably really didn't touch on in the Planning Environment meeting was the um, the flooding issues associated with this site and the, um, the fact that the applicant hasn't demonstrated that um, access can be provided to the rear lot, which is uh, uh, above the 1%, above the 10% AEP. Um, and also, if, if access were to be provided, if there were works that were required to the culvert, what the impact of those works would be on the riparian buffer. So that's a significant issue. Um, furthermore, um, the applicant hasn't been agreeable to the proposed um, extent of rehabilitation that the council officers are seeking and the extent of the, um, the covenant. The council officers are seeking for an outcome that was uh, the same as the adjoining property, which um, council refused but was um, settled on appeal. Um, so we're seeking a, a covenant area of the same size, which would be um, 10 metres to the eastern side of the waterway and then uh, I think it's 75 metres to the western side of the waterway. Um, but the works that would occur in that, um, 
uh, covenant area would be uh, 10 metres either side of the waterway to have some active regeneration uh, and rehabilitation and then for the remainder of the area to be planted out with um, koala uh, to koala trees at a ratio of about one to every 10 square metres, again consistent with the uh, outcome that was on the adjoining property. And then that leads itself into the uh, bushfire risk that would be associated with that rehabbed area. Um, the applicants provided a bushfire report that doesn't consider the extent of rehab work that council is seeking and that therefore we can't rely on that existing report to um, demonstrate that the proposed house site is adequate. Notwithstanding, they do propose there's quite a significant um, area around the house site of about 60 square metres. So that is something that we think with some further work by the applicant may be able to be resolved. But again, the key issue is around that access across the waterway. And just uh, some comments that have, uh, that, and questions that have come up around that. The recent reconfiguration at Glen Ridge um, is different to this site. And the reason is because the, the road access was a, above the 1%, sorry, above the 10% AEP on that site. And also they were seeking to re, rehab the Covenant area, uh, rehab the riparian buffer area, sorry. Thank you, Joe. So questions? <coughs> With regard to the, the flood access, the different, you mentioned Green Ridge. The difference being that Green Ridge had a flood study that, and the um, access was provided above the 10% AEP mark. Is that correct? There was a flood study and, the, and they were able to demonstrate that the access would be above that 10% AEP. So what's missing here is a flood study to ascertain uh, that the culvert access currently is or isn't above the 10% AEP or what would be required to raise it to uh, above the 10% AEP to be consistent with what we're going to agree with. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. But so based on the contours, the site contours, um, it looks like that crossing is below the 10% so what's suggested is so the, the, some works would be the crossing may require some raising or right. some culvert work yeah. underneath to, to facilitate. Okay, but the extent you, of is, which we don't know. Because that's right, that answers question one. Yeah. Question two, as far as a house lot actually being situated here and having sufficient fire buffer around the house lot, has that been able to be ascertained in the proposal that, that's been put forward? I, uh, Patrick has referred to 75 metres of, uh, of replanting from the, uh, uh, from the creek line in that riparian buffer zone, but does that allow sufficient room for a house site with sufficient bushfire clearance around it to be constructed? Or is there more work to be done to ascertain where that house site may sit and the clearance around it and the, and the, and the planting that may, re uh, whether the planting would or wouldn't come into that area? There is more work that needs to be done by the applicant in that regard to demonstrate that the extent of rehabilitation works that we're seeking would not present a fire risk to a proposed house site. And as far as rehabilitation works go, um, is there any scope for part of the rehabilitation works to actually be at the rear of the property, uh, joining the Tronks, um, Tronks Creek at the rear of the property, uh, to lessen that uh, 75 metre um, wide planting area that you're suggesting? Well, we're seeking the um, 75 metre wide area to the western side of the waterway, which would be consistent with the the outcome on the adjoining property. And that's important because it creates that linkage. You know, we've got the koala trees on the adjoining property and, and that's really important to provide that consistently, that same kind of linkage on this property. But given that um, the performance outcome or acceptable outcome, sorry, in this, uh, in this case only refers to 10 metres, um, why are we seeking that 75 metres to, to re-establish? I mean, this is, a, this is a, 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 a significantly cleared block in relation to the block next door. The block next door had a significant amount of vegetation being retained upon it. Um, why are we seeking such a, such a large buffer? If, if it's been cleared, uh, is um, uh, any additional planting a, a, an environmental um, uh, outcome? Well, having some additional planting um, is certainly a positive environmental outcome. Um, but just as a point of clarity, the planning scheme refers to 10 metres either side of a waterway, and it also refers to the, the, the riparian buffer as well. So by virtue of rehabbing 10 metres either side of the waterway doesn't give you a tick in terms of your rehab of the riparian buffer. That's still an issue that needs to be resolved. So where did the 75 metres come up? Is that because of what was achieved on the block next door, or is that a standard that we have? Well, that's the width of the riparian buffer. The there mapped, is no riparian the, buffer the, currently. The, the mapped riparian buffer, the in, the plan, riparian buffer. in the planning scheme. Yeah. 
and the, and that that width of the riparian buffer will, will vary throughout the shire, and that'll be determined on the the type of waterway, the, the level of the waterway, the stream the stream water. I think we had a bit of an argument on that in the, in the previous one, but I'll refer to that in my argument section. Thank you, Joe. Any other questions for staff? Um, one question, Patrick. So you're saying that there is still opportunity to subdivide the block, um, but not how it's presented in this application. Well, the the level of detail, level of material that's required for us to to be satisfied with compliance with the scheme hasn't been provided at this point. Um, but we would think, with some further work by the, by the applicant, yep. that it's likely that they would be able to get there. So, so more, more work is required because we just don't know um, the extent of that flooding through that waterway and you, you don't want to create a lot that's continually cut off yeah. um, when we get some heavy rain. I'm not talking about a major event of 100, I'm just talking about some heavy rain for 10% AP which occurs quite regularly. All our roads throughout the Shire, they're, you know, they're, when we build new roads they're designed to 10% AP. That's the, the general standard to get access to, to house, house blocks. So. When I go through the tracking documents um, and the information request, I can't remember, I could be um, wrong, but did we request a hydraulic report or a flood report um, by the applicant? Was that requested? Um, I believe it was. I do recall rereading re the information request recently and the first item certainly referred to the access. And that to be was able 12 months, about 11 months. Months ago, yeah. there was nothing recent I could yeah. find. The flood study it didn't focus on the access, it focused it on showing that there was um, an area for the house to be built that was above the PMF, so it hasn't focused on the access, which is what we're raising. So, it's not suggesting that a house lot can't be achieved with a suitable crossing, it's just that flood study to ascertain at what level that crossing needs to be yeah. at to, uh, to satisfy that because the house lot is above the is above the flood. That's right. That's right. Okay. right. So just a question. From the data required to identify the problem problem maximum flood, and that one that one percent AP. Is it a straight extrapolation to what the level may be in a in a one ten percent AEP? Or is it likely to be more significant more work required to no, explain that level? No, I understand there's significant more work to, to work that out. Yeah. The, the problem with the one lot subdivision. Yeah, yeah. Look, it, it probably, um, <coughs> based on discussions with our flood engineer, our hydrologist, it's probably going to cost another $5,000 for them to do that work. But that's probably irrelevant to this discussion. <laughs> yeah. okay. Given that access is also access to a, a tower at the rear of the site, um, is it, uh, were any thoughts put into the access when that tower was considered with regard to um, flood access? Um, well, uh, it was, um, but insofar as a tower, um, people only attend the site for maintenance purposes. So it's only attended on a you know irregular, infrequent basis. So very different to a house site where people need to get in and out of their, site, ha their house site on a daily basis. So um, whilst the crossing may go under um, and that would restrict access to the tower. I think that's regular because they, they only need to attend it for maintenance purposes. Okay, on the other side, though, uh, what about roads into and out of uh, out of uh, Karoiba itself? Are you accessing uh, Tawantum or getting back into town? At what point would that be under compared to uh, getting access to the town? So, uh, is it is it relevant to uh, the the flood levels of the roads around and access out of uh, the property in general? For the tower or the house no, site? No, no, for the house site. Um, we probably don't have that information to know whether all the roads, what level they're all built at, um, but generally what's designed for roads is 10% AEP. That's, that's, that's what, yeah. I, I guess that's the answer I was getting to. The design, the design of the roads is around that 10%, yeah. so if this is the equivalent of that, it's equivalent to that's right. what will and what won't be happening on access outside of yeah. outside Look, the property. Look, there may be some roads that are you know, built years ago that may be under that. Under that. Um, but I don't have that information. But if those roads were to be upgraded now, they'll have to be built to that's the right, that's Okay, so that's where the 10% is relevant. That's right. Thank you. Um, I note you explained the difference with Glenridge before, um, the application for Glenridge. Um, my understanding, and again, if you can just clarify it, Patrick, was that um, when there is a major flood 
um, event and my understanding again was that that house site area was much more constrained by the maximum flood levels than this one. The um, outcome of that was that people were going to shelter in place, that access wasn't as so important because you know you just stay in your home until the water subsides which is can be 12 hours or 24 hours. Um, same considerations given to this application where you can't make that assessment well, without the hydraulic or flood reports? Well both the house sites were above the PMF yeah. but it's the access into those lots that's different that Glen Ridge oh, in, would, in, as opposed to in and out. Well, in yeah. and out. So for, for the owners of the property, occupiers of the property or even emergency services, um, that road into Glen Ridge, into the site, um, is it achieves the 10% AEP, whereas this one doesn't. Well, this one hasn't demonstrated a, a, that it does and what works be required if it doesn't. Okay. Yep. Thank you. All right, we have a motion before. Does anyone care to move it? No, I'm going to move a, an alternate motion. Yep. I'd like to move a deferral motion uh, to uh, uh, this until uh, Thursday night's meeting to give uh, staff time to uh, go back to the uh, applicant and look at the opportunities of, uh, of uh, negotiation with regard to where the house lot is and, uh, and whether um, uh, the planning can be achieved and the fire outcomes can be, uh, can be negotiated as well as the, uh, an understanding of why the, uh, the flood study and the 10% AEP is required. How much of that do you want me to uh, to allow our staff to further uh, negotiate with the applicant on the outcomes of flooding and, uh, and flood mitigation. Raised in the report. Is that sufficient to say, Kevin? Mm -hmm. the the Is it issues of flood access? Uh, of flood yeah. access. Yeah. Okay. Of access, yeah. Oh. Hmm? Oh, no, it's it's the and fire. So just to clarify for councillors, obviously between now and Thursday, the applicant's not going to be able to prepare a flood study. No, no, no. But at least it will allow us to have the discussion with the applicant to see if they'll extend out the time frame in order to address this <coughs> additional information. And that's what I'm referring to. Is that, yeah. is, is that covered in, in what, I've, what I've said in, that, uh, in the wording there? Or do you, can, you th can, can it be worded better? Maybe this <coughs> is yeah, you might help. Regarding flood and fire issues? Regarding fire, flood and fire issues. Can I ask, would it be better to go to the applicant and ask if he wants to start the clock? Yeah. Well, that's, 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 I think that's what, that's what, we're, I think that's what I'm trying to achieve yeah. there. Okay, yeah. that's, that's the intent of my, uh, my, uh, should, uh, my motion. It, shouldn't it be regarding potential flood and fire issues? Yeah, right, yes. Happy to, see, happy to see that word. Oh, I said flood and fire issues raised. Mm. Um, through, through the chair, Councillor Drew, so I, I, I think that's... Um, Broad enough as a bit of a catch all, mm. so that allows the discussion to be. Thank you. Nobody has any objection. As much as then I'll put that forward. Thank you. Have a second for that, please. Second for Brian. Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Lawrence is already Councillor Lawrence. Joe. Look, having spoken to the applicant, I uh, I was challenged by some of the, uh, the the points the staff have raised with regard to other um, decisions that have been uh, through the council recently, but I now ha have a greater understanding. I believe that the uh, um, uh, the applicant was fairly firm in his, his standing there, but I think that uh, with the matters discussed here, and uh, uh, that there's at least the opportunity to at least uh, give the applicant a bit more time to consider the matters raised, and to see if there is some uh, some um, uh, further compromise that can be reached with regard to uh, achieving the outcomes of both uh, from an environment perspective and uh, from a, a subdivision perspective. Um, so, I think it'd be good also to inform both those conversations and the decision of the applicant if they have an indication of what council's appetite is for the development on both issues. Um, so, in my my view, uh, the floating issue, the ten percent, is the probably we can't go below that stand design. I do think there's room for negotiation um, in terms of the extent to which we 
seek rehabilitation and enhancement um, as a result of the riparian buffer. Uh, after we had next door, I actually wrote a quite a lengthy thing to staff about we need to review um, the planning scheme because although throughout the document we used terms like uh, um, enhance and rehabilitate and there was one other, to restoration ecologists, they all have different meanings. And what we ask, if it's just enhancing, then a small 10 metre may be enhancing. I also think in this site, um, the creek that's separating the two proposed house sites, or the wetland, or whatever it was previously, is highly degraded. It's a series of farm dams. Um, so the potential biodiversity benefit in this site is actually more to the rear of the site, because that abuts a tributary of the Ringtail Creek, which is remnant vegetation, which is a quail area. I actually think it's probably reasonable for a one lot subdivision to try and make the link into next door, um, but also to look at allowing regeneration in the back area, which is where uh, any self respecting quail is more likely to go anyway because of the, the level of remnant beside it. And if you go to the next one, I do think if we had slightly less requirements in the 75 metres up the front that it does allow for um, significant potential bushfire buffer, buffer around their identified house site. So to me, I'm willing to look at something like that. Um, you know, linking up on the eastern side with the boundary for the next order of development. And then I think you know, if you get the 70 metres to by, by skewing it like that, but keeping to it about, when I looked on site, about 30 metres is about where you've got a rise, uh, which would be the, I think, you know, probably close to probable maximum, uh, probably close to the one to 100 year flight level or something. I think that is getting the enhancement that we want um, and I suppose that looking at it from an outcome perspective, the, the way we've done that, we, we've mapped the repair and buffers to try and improve those connectivity and improve the biodiversity. If we say no, um, because they can't get that in with bushfire, then we're not likely to get that benefit anyway. Uh, so to me, I think I'm willing to go with a, a, a narrow uh, rehabilitation reveg area to the west of the, um, the farm dam waterway. Um, but also identify up to back some regeneration area as well and and providing there is a solution in terms of getting to a, uh, a Kempton AEP uh, crossing I'm happy to support the proposal. Um, Kerry, is the option proposed by um, Councillor Stockwell reasonable and doable? I think it is reasonable. I think there is some scope to look at that 75 metres. Um, you know, the advice I've always had from ecologists over years is a wildlife corridor is around 50. Um, so, you know, I'd be looking for somewhere around that, which is less than the 75. So that's certainly some scope to um, look at some options there with the applicant. Fantastic. Tom? Uh, Kathy, could you go back to Brian's photo? Sorry for... Um, go to the one right above it. There's the lease A. So I, I'm looking at where, um, the, the, where the lease A is right sort of the middle of the, the left property there. That's where the, the tower is, I suspect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the next slide down, and it says house site area. Is that the same as where the tower is? No, no the tower's on the adjoining block. adjoining block. Oh, right, right. Okay. Yeah, 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 gotcha. Thank you for that. Yeah. Can I ask Brian a question? Yeah. Did you do you not measurements you have there for those regen areas? Um, the width, the total width. Specific. No, no, I, I just looked what looked like a reasonable thing based on I did on imagery first. So when I was on site, I thought twenty five to thirty meters on the west was was probably where you'd have it if you would get the slopes. When I was saying well, where 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 is the change of slope? But yeah, and I wasn't going to be prescriptive in in that. I just thought. If I, was, if I was going to go in there as a, a waterway rehabilitation, I wouldn't be recommending any more than 25 probably. Um, but if we're looking at it from a waterway perspective, if you're looking at getting some koala, you might go a little bit more to get the, to get the side sort of. Um, obviously with that, the land hops concerns about fire hazards through the middle of the block. Um, naturally you'd find Melalucas would be coming back there which do have a fire potential, but if you Looked at what should be in the understory there, it would be tend to be far more fire suppressant understory than um, if you got it right than just you know, long, long uh, exotic grasses underneath the old so, yeah. 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 For the purpose of making
moving the debate along, I'll speak in favour of the motion. Uh, certainly right to see more information from the applicant because we, we just cannot approve uh, a subdivision without knowing whether or not there's safe access to the flood or not. We need that information. No council would um, approve the subdivision without knowing whether uh, uh, the residents can get in and out safely during the minimum standard required for flood, flood access. So, of course, I'll support the uh, motion. No one else wish to speak before Joe closes? Yeah, like, uh, like Brian, when I visited the site, I saw the potential for some revegetation. I saw the potential for revegetation at, uh, at both ends of that, uh, that block. I did see a highly degraded block that, uh, that, that any uh, uh, reveg replanting um, would be of a significant uh, environmental benefit. But I did see limits as to where I thought that, uh, that could go, and I think the, the, the sloping ground was, uh, was an element of that. Um, with the right understory planting, of course, yeah, it'll help minimise the, uh, uh, the fire risks, as, as Brian has alluded to. So I think with all those things, uh, I understand the, the, the flood risk now far better. Thank you to the staff for, uh, for working through that issue with me, and I see why the, uh, the need for the flood study is, uh, is required. So I think that uh, if those things are explained, uh, there may be an opportunity here for, the, uh, for, for an outcome that benefits us all. Those in favour? That's unanimous. Next item is um, further item four, which is um, further report application for material change of use of dwelling house 66 Seaview, Seaview Terrace, Sunshine Beach. It's a report to Director General on page 15 of the General Committee agenda. Amelia. Um, I'm Councillor Lawrence and inform the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter as Deborah Reid has submitted to the application as a personal friend. Although I have a declarable conflict of interest, I do not believe a reasonable person could have a perception of bias because I believe I do not have a close personal relationship with Ms Reid. Therefore, I will choose to remain in the meeting. However, I will respect the decision of the meeting on whether I can remain and participate in the decision. On the Joe, I'll ask a question of Council Lawrence, and if I might, for uh, this go on. Uh, can you explain the nature of the relationship you have with Miss Ruby, please? Um, uh, Deborah's um, daughter um, went to the same school, not the same year as my daughter. She's younger than my daughter. Um, and I've known Deborah just through school functions, social functions, and coffees at St Andrews. Um, that was some time ago. We pulled our children out um, a few years ago and they now attend Sunshine State High School. Um, uh, I, um, my daughter has, when she was five or six or seven, had a two, three hour play date with um, Deb's daughter. They both did dancing ballet at ballet school. Um, Deb um, and her husband Brent once, maybe 15, 20 years ago, came to my house for dinner as part of a big group of parents <coughs> from St Andrews. Um, and we've attended the normal coffee lunches during my lunch days at St Andrews, um, but that was some time ago. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, Satisfied, yeah. I'll move that. Um, Councillor Lawrenston, the Council note the declarable conflict of interest by Councillor Lawrenston and determine that it is in the public interest that Councillor Lawrenston participates and votes on this matter because Council believes that Councillor Lawrenston does not have a close personal relationship with the submitter, Miss Reid, and therefore a reasonable person would trust that the final decision is made in the public interest. Right. Second. Seconded by Joe. Can you speak to it? No, I think Amelia's, it's been very self explanatory. Amelia's um, covered all areas. I'm very comfortable with Amelia staying in the room. Any other councillors to speak to this motion? All in favour? That's unanimous. Noting that we didn't vote. Noting that Amelia didn't vote, of course. Um, right. Um, Patrick, give us an overview of the application, <coughs> especially in view of the investigation into the overlooking issue and how that affects the overall height in terms of stories okay. of the application. Okay. Um, you may recall back in July that this matter was presented to the Planning and Environment Committee meeting. There are a number of um, planning controls on the site, uh, you know, particularly around landslide, so, and um, the, the site is also known to be erosion prone. Uh, so. There were some geotechnical investigations, a hydraulic engineer uh, was engaged. 
um, and they've made their recommendations which were included in the conditions of approval. Uh, there's also uh, matters around the front setback, site cover, the development being three storeys and the inclusion of the rooftop terrace. Um, after some debate at the planning environment meeting, the applicant uh, stopped the clock um, and has since then extended the decision making period with some amended plans. And the purpose of those amended plans were to address some overlooking concerns that have been raised by a nearby property. Uh, on review of those plans and on review of the potential overlooking to the nearby property, um, I formed the opinion that the development does result in overlooking to the adjoining property and that the proposed uh, measures to mitigate the overlooking are not satisfactory and that the rooftop terrace should be deleted. Um, uh, and just to, to confirm that the matters that were the the measures that were proposed were a 1.4 metre high angled privacy screen, which sat um, back from a one, meet, uh, a one metre wide planter, and there was also proposed to uh, transplant <coughs> an eight metre high canopy tree into the area between the dwelling and the side boundary. Um, yeah, so I thought whilst, um, you know, it's noted that the 1.4 metre high screen wouldn't be suitable to address the overlooking, um, if a, a, the screen was to be increased in height, it would create some unreasonable bulk and um, cause the dwelling to go over eight metres in height. So I didn't think it was reasonable to condition that outcome. Uh, as I said, therefore, it's been recommended that a condition be included requiring amended plans which delete the rooftop terrace. That would bring it to a two-storey dwelling? Which would bring it to a two-storey dwelling, that's correct. Questions, councillors, or any other aspects of the application? Sorry about a, a two-storey dwelling. You, you mean three-storey dwelling? It's currently two-storey dwelling. It's currently proposed with the rooftop terrace, and that has a small element of three storeys because of that uh, rooftop terrace. Uh, but with the condition recommending that the rooftop terrace be deleted, it would <coughs> therefore be a two-storey dwelling. So just to clarify, what we had before us in the planning uh, committee included removal of the rooftop terrace. The initial recommendation yes. did not include the removal of So how do we get to a, um, an application came to us in July, it comes to us in September with for approval at the initial meeting <coughs> and then a change between the initial meeting and the general committee meeting? So I've been out, since that meeting I've been able to go out to the adjoining property and, and uh, reassess my um, evaluation of overlooking based upon that inspection, and it's my opinion that um, the rooftop terrace will result in overlooking. And that wasn't picked up previously? No, it wasn't. Um, the, the applicant's representative, uh, I, I met them out on site, and they've shown me a set of drawings that suggest that there are, are no overlooking um, uh, concerns, and they've been on site and actually done measurements on the, on, the, uh, on the adjoining property as well, according to what they've told me. Um, how is it that you, that, they, that what they presented suggests there are no overlooking and yet what you're saying is that there are overlooking issues? Is it the height of the... Well, the height of the rooftop terrace, it is quite high. But the, the, the wall adjoining that was supposed to be the, the thing that prevented the overlooking? Well, a 1.4 metre high screen is quite small. Um, generally, you'd be looking to 1.7, 1.8 metres in terms of um, a screen. Um, the drawings that they're provided, I think, are based on an average height person of 1.65 square metres. So the view line that they're provided is um, it underestimates the potential for overlooking for a range of people that would occupy the site or, or attend the site. Well, ask the so 1.4 is too low. 1.8 would exceed the height limit. Is there a height in between there? Is there a maximum height at which a screen could be could be achieved? That, that wouldn't exceed the eight I, metre I height? I think what would address it would be reducing the size of the rooftop terrace. So at the moment no, you've actually, got a landscape bed um, one metre wide, which helps set the balustrading where a person is standing on that edge. Mm -hmm. that, that helps to an extent to stop the immediate looking straight down into mm -hmm. the neighbouring property, um, but it'd have to be set back. But you still see out into the neighbouring property's yard and use area. So what you're suggesting So you'd have to set that quite substantially back from that side boundary. So from that side boundary, the setback from the side yeah. boundary to achieve? Or from that side of the house. Do we have any idea of how much that would have to be no. achieved or is that something for the uh, applicant? It's really something for the applicant to, to design to. Okay, thank you. Well, 
I've got a series of questions. Um, I've got one main concern, but I want to get clear in my head um, what level of discretion is being recommended uh, for approval. So the first one is there's a statement in there that says, furthermore, that part of the building is within six metres from the front setback, so from CB Terrace, is generally below the maximum eight metre height from this floor. Uh, so the generally below, does that mean there's elements of it that are above the uh, eight metres? Uh, probably the wording, I'm, I'm not sure the full context of the wording, I can't quite remember it, but what I was alluding to there was um, if you had a building um, that was fully compliant with the setback at six metres and then at no height going back from the front setback was at above eight metres, so if you did that eight metre height blanket, uh, with the land falling away, that that element at the front wouldn't be higher than anything in that area. Yep. So at the front, it's below eight metres above the ground level. Yeah. But um, then yeah, what... So where it goes over is where you've got your basement cut in. It's, that, there, um, it? it's really that um, structure, that flume, I think it is in the corner of the building is the, is the, the issue. Okay. Um, the coastal hazard, another quote in here is the coastal hazard assessment has found that proposed house and pool are unlikely to be subject to erosion from the sea during expected lifespan, i.e. 60 years. Can we clarify the above statement like based on how, how likely is it? Um, I think that's a conversation that I'd, I would need to have with our con consultants um, to give a, a probability. So yeah. when we can I answer it this way? Um, so we've had uh, the same consultants look at this house as they did for a house down the road, which was subject to an appeal. I think it was 54 C3 mm -hmm. Terrace. So the same consultants have looked at it for that appeal as they have for this one. So that house and, and this one is going to be designed um, to deal with the 0.8 metre um, sea level rise and deal with coastal erosion processes by 2100. So they're saying that um, it will withstand, the design foundation will withstand a 500, 500 year um, RAA storm tide and recession due to storm level. So they are satisfied that the design will withstand the coastal processes. Yeah. Okay, so that, that means the piling for that. Yep. And with, you know, I say the same, they've got piles going down with the concrete sprayed over it or whatever it joints or whatever it's called. That'll be on the, the coastal building line, is that right? That's how it's being piled. And then the balcony, well, what should be a balcony comes out over that. So what it suggests to me is that in the mapping, by, by the 2070 mark, that in the life of this building, mm. the beach could be underneath people's bedrooms and their living room and their, and their, lawn, and their kitchen. So people, if the 2070 mapping, there's a one, one and a hundred year mapping goes further up the block, so the piling creates the edge to the beach. If the erosion occurs in a one in a hundred year event, like one hundred year flood, we have the bedroom, the, the kitchen and the living room over the top of the beach in, as one option. Oh, it'll be far worse than that. If you have a look at the mapping that's done for the chap, they may not even get a drive in the driveway. That's in 2100. That's right. Yeah, 2070 I'm thinking about, because 2100 is outside the life of the building, so 2070 line. The 2070 line is still the whole property. So it'd be far worse. So that, that's just one of my, my questions. Is I, it does establish... Um, uh, so with the three stories we've, we've covered. Oh, the other one is this, the view from the beach and the, the, um, and to a certain extent the walkway. Um, the, if, if we were to bring the, the development compliance, and I'm particularly thinking about the recommendation to have a covered enclosed uh, three rooms, which the scheme suggests is just should be an uncovered balcony or deck. Uh, if we went with the scheme with the coastal building on PO3, um, and well, we're going with rooftop terraces, that would have a reduced, would that have a reduced sense of bulk from the beach? And, you know, I suppose the question is, what do you see from the beach? Do you see do you see that bulky um, area projecting into beyond the coastal building line from the beach? And then if that was actually to be brought back into compliance with the performance outcome, would that bulk be less from, as viewed from the beach? Have we done that analysis? Yeah, I've been onto the beach to view the site and um, I've looked at it in context of the surrounding area. And um, 
you know, it's quite interesting when you're looking at a site that's fully, you know, got vegetation all through it and you're trying to imagine what's going to be there. Mm. But certainly I can see the scale and bulk and the colour of buildings within the surrounding area are, are very, very dominant um, and they come well beyond the coastal building line. Um, I mean, if, if you're reducing the amount of built form in an area, you're obviously going to see less, but you're still going to see the building behind it. So. I think it's, um, it's, it is difficult to say, you know, exactly, but um, I don't think, you know, as per my initial assessment, I don't think the scale and bulk of this, as viewed from the beach, is going to be, is, is a detrimental outcome. And I'll just, um, sorry, go back to the chat mapping. That's the 2070 line. Yeah. So you can see that it takes out the majority <coughs> of the property yeah. by 2100. What the building design would do would be to actually stop to at the point where the piles are. Well, <coughs> but it might be a, it might yeah. be a, in, in a bit of an island. It'd be the Malibu house sitting over the beach. Yes, it yeah. will be the Malibu house. In 2100, there's probably no road there. Yeah. Um, can I ask a question? I've got in front of me the Coastal Hazard Assessment Report that was put together by Royal Tuscany. And there's a lot of really interesting stuff in that. And um, they talk about sediment transport, accretion of sand, in that northern pocket and sort of what I've taken away from this is that um, that every property have different sets of circumstances um, and we've got to look at every property in that context um, that possibly a blunt line or you know one wheel doesn't fit, fit all so um, just for any of the other councillors who haven't had the opportunity there's an incredible um, assessment report, coastal hazard assessment report, and there's also a really great geotechnical investigation report, um, again by the two external consultants that I think council used in its planning and environment appeal. Yeah. Really great information. On there. Look, certainly if I may comment that it is um, a really significant issue that this council is going to have to have a look at. These properties are probably some of the worst affected in the Shire. Um, and you know that's why we're putting this report to council for a decision. Um, but where we have got the best advice from our external experts around engineering um, and geotechnical to recommend how to address these <coughs> coastal erosion processes. Because at the moment the planning scheme allows a house to be built on this site. All the other properties along Seaview Terrace, or just about all of them in this short strip intrude into this coastal building line. Um, the one at uh, 54 that I referred to down the road with an appeal um, substantially intrudes into the coastal building line. So not just cantilever, it's got foundations in the coastal um, building line. This one doesn't? This one doesn't. It's actually set back behind the coastal yes. building line <coughs> and it cantilevers out. Yes, it's not consistent with our outcomes, um, but we have gone through a whole appeal process with 54. And if we want to achieve a different outcome, we need to change the planning scheme and change the words around it. So there's a couple of questions that come out of that. And, and I understand where you're coming from. I'm not, what, what, there's, there's two things that have led to the substantial non-compliance with the current planning scheme. Is this a question? Yeah, right? yeah. Um, Am I correct that most of those would have been built at the time the state government had a guideline that you could consider uh, where your neighbour's property was when you built it and therefore there was this progressive creep and the state government no longer has that policy? Um, so the coastal building loan comes back from the Beach Protection Authority, which I think goes back to the 80s. And it was based on the best science advice at the time. Um, now, when I started with Noosa Council, um, early 2000, um, the advice, the applications actually go, used to go to the Beach Protection Authority or the state for advice. And yes, they did have a, a varied approach when it came to that coastal building line. So that's why we will see some houses in that coastal building line. Council, um, over time, was then asked, that was delegated to council to make the decision. Um, and council had some respect for the coastal erosion processes, but they also used to very much look still at the visual amenity along the area and ensure houses coming forward were not going to impact on visual views for neighbouring properties. So the requirements over time have changed um, and yes, our planning scheme needs to put much more emphasis 
on coastal erosion processes than it has in the past. And then the second one, in terms of 54, um, my recollection is when we went to appeal on that one, one of the factors we had to consider was about the uh, legal provisions around when you're upgrading an existing house. So they had an existing house on 54 that was substantially in the coastal building line and they were, they were doing a development that was replacing that. That, that is a, not a consideration in this one because there's no existing house. Yeah, right? yeah you, you are correct. That there is a different consideration for 54 because it had an existing house that also was in the coastal building line. Uh, so that weighed up in the, the minds of the solicitors and our experts. Um, but what came strongly um, through to me is the building line, the coastal building line, they called it quite an arbitrary line because mm. it's so old and not based on more recent science and specifics of the property. Um, so they felt that they could not give weight, significant weight to making sure that house was back behind that coastal building line because it, it was so old, it was based on data from the 80s and it wasn't up to date and then. And they called it an arbitrary line. Yeah, so not to argue with any of that. Um, however, the current less arbitrary line is a long way further away from the lift. Is that correct in terms of the range of What well, we are after within a planning scheme and what, as a condition of approval of our scheme, we have to start to do a scheme amendment to reflect our coastal hazard reduction. That's right. We need to work towards incorporating that in our scheme and the plan was when we did the 2020 scheme to complete the CHAP and take the learnings from that CHAP process and make our planning scheme amendments. Now that hasn't occurred. What we have today in the 2020 scheme is almost identical as the 2006 scheme. So just to clarify, the principal um, uh, uh, element of non-compliance is the enclosed cantilevered veranda? That's right. And with the the rooftop deck removed. Uh, there, there'll be no to to handle the issue of overlooking. Um, it will be essentially compliant with the planning scheme as it sits. That's right. There. It is be compliant with the scheme and consistent with the legal advice and the experts' opinion for 54 Seaview Terrace. And one of the preference reasons for not having an enclosed um, veranda or a cantilever balcony was to was to um, prevent issues of um, site blockage for neighbouring properties. Will this enclose, what's, what's been your assessment of the impact of that on the neighbourhood, the neighbours' views um, on the the adjoining, there's so much vegetation on the adjoining property to the south that it, it would not, I mean, they'll, they'll still be blocked by their own vegetation, okay. so it won't impact on it. And property to the north? Well, their house is set well, well back. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Can I just maybe just make one point? You did talk about non-compliances. There is a front setback non-compliance, which has obviously been addressed in the original report and justified as well. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, question in terms of PO15 and roof, roof terrace. Um, were the neighbours contacted prior to the development application being lodged? Um, so I, I, this is code assess, accessible, not impact, so there is no time I, I know to notify, to go to public notification. That's correct. Um, what concerns me is, um, question. Uh, my question is, just reading PO15, um, quote, doesn't create um, opportunities for residents or building users to overlook their private open space or view into habitable windows or doors of neighbouring properties. Um, when I read that, I would think that the only way you can reach a decision was actually going to the neighbours on both sides and asking or checking whether there is any intrusion or overlooking. So, um, if I put an application for a roof terrace, um, will you be knocking on my neighbours' doors? It's likely we would be, and if I had my time again, I probably would on this one. But just to fill in some gaps, we received a letter from a planning consultant representing the, uh, the nearby neighbour yep. and advised that they looked at the plans and were aware that we'd made an information request and would be reviewing that information request and would be in touch with us with any concerns. So I, I hadn't heard anything back from that consultant through the assessment process. 
Um, yes, whilst I say it would have been ideal to have gone out and I should have looked at it myself, that did to some degree inform me as to the opinion of the neighbouring property around um, the reasonableness of this application. Because I, I made the same inference that when it came to the planning and environment that it was okay by the neighbours, so mm. I'm glad it was picked up. Yeah. Yeah. We have a motion before us, Senator Kerr, to move this motion. I actually have that. Oh, Tom, for your part. Yeah. Uh, of course, the, the drainage, and it says it just it, it simply says that um, that the that uh, the water that enters the property will be put up onto the <coughs> public. How will they do that? Is that is it a series of pumps or what? What, what is the, the mechanism? Um, it's through gravity, so it, uh, it's a charge line. So from the roof, um, there'll be some fall, and the, the pressure of the water will push it up into the the street. Um, it means that there'll always be some water. Um, in the charge line, but the, as I said, when, when it rains, the pressure of the water um, will push that out into the into the um, street system. And um, what does that what does that mean? Pushing it into the street system. So there's obviously a drain that's going to come up into the street with gravity. The roofs up here, water goes down underground and then up onto the street like that. It'll be out into the gutter. Into the gutter. Yeah. I'd say into the gutter or there's um, operational works approvals that will be required because um, the applicant will need to ensure that the the form of the road doesn't result in the water going into adjoining properties. So um, it generally would go into the gutter, but if that's going to cause some issues because of the, um, the mm -hmm. camber of the road, then they'll need to do some, some works within the road uh, to alleviate that. Yeah, I did. It's a, it's a steep road. It, 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 I, I don't I don't see a, a way out, but it, it you know the the water now goes into the sand and goes down into the property down to the beach the, through the through the the, na the nature area that's not undeveloped. But then when you put a house there, then you change the nature of how the water is going to yeah yeah. Um, so and on that, the hydraulic engineer has advised that there cannot be any infiltration pits to the rear of the site because it will impact on the stability of the site, and that's why it has to go out to the road. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my understanding is that um, with ro with reserves, uh, road reserves and the like on a, on a property, that uh, if there wasn't a footpath there or wasn't a gutter there uh, within the road reserve, the council could request that uh, a developer or an applicant installs a footpath, a missing missing link of footpath, a missing link of curb and guttering in a road reserve. Is the same applicable to? Uh, the reserve at the rear of the property, where an environmental concern might be. My, the reason I raise it is because I notice a significant number of weeds upon this particular site, and those weeds go down the slope into the reserve below. Is there, a, is there any scope or any mechanism for council to uh, require uh, clearance of those weeds and maybe re-establishment of, uh, of the environmental reserve? Um, the scheme does refer to the requirement for frontage works and footpaths and the like. Uh, but there's no requirement in the scheme to require rehabilitation of adjoining uh, environmental lands, foreshore land. Okay, thank you. Through the chair. Yeah, I just have a question with regards to that. Um, how would that be made possible further down the track? Would that be via a scheme amendment or through the foreshore management plan? How could um, that be something that's considered when other um, applications come before us with reference to maintaining that foreshore? Yeah. Um, being a code accessible application, the application can only be assessed against the scheme codes that are nominated relevant for a house. So if council wish to investigate the possibility of having house owners help um, weed or manage the adjacent reserve, it would need to be included in the planning scheme codes and then we could apply it as conditions of approval. But again, you know, it, conditions regardless have to be reasonable and relevant, so it would be fairly limited sort of frontage works as you Sort of referring to. I'm assuming it's something that has to come up in the foreshore management plan to, to, to proceed that. Yeah, there's a foreshore management plan being developed for eastern beaches um, and certainly that's some of the feedback officers gave to that foreshore management plan that's being drafted. Um, but that foreshore management plan will come before council down the track too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Karen, finish your question then, Tom. Oh, it's just regarding another matter, um, something in reference to what council Jurassic said. Um, in terms of the height of the, what is it, that pipe that comes up, um, that we must remove the rooftop terrace and it has to be in compliance to the satisfaction of the manager development assessment. 
is there no further negotiation to meet a middle ground on that on that height? Or has that been all exhausted? I'm sorry, I don't quite understand. Well, that. the applicant has indicated that they would like a rooftop terrace. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think they've indicated that they would consider a condition requiring the balustrade come up. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So they've indicated they would accept a condition requiring a greater height of that screen between the neighbour and the property so they could be not be overlooking. Um, officers are not recommending that as previously advised because of the bulk and the height issue. Um, to me, the better solution would be to actually pu push back that roof terrace from the edge of the building so that you don't get those overlooking opportunities. Um, but that, that requires further consideration by the applicant and working out where that might be placed on site. Um, Tom, then you would, um, Could we put a condition in this instead of saying no rooftop terrace, put a condition to say you just have to do exactly what you just said? Is that a condition that we could put in here instead of saying no rooftop terms? Um, well, that's an option for council. Um, I wouldn't recommend that. It's not a strong position for council to take. I think um, you know there, this is a, a change application. No, this is a um, a code accessible a code accessible MCU. So the applicant will have through um, the process an opportunity to negotiate conditions with council, so that those discussions can still occur. Um, with the applicant, if they wish to do that. Yeah. Oh, overall, are there very many places that have rooftop terraces? Is that the, are they encouraged or? Uh, well, the um, the 2006 scheme first introduced a requirement for no rooftop terraces. Um, we do support some rooftop terraces where they can demonstrate that there's no overlooking occur. Um, you know, because there was a strong amount of concern raised by the community prior to the 2006 scheme about the impact it was having mm -hmm. from these roof terraces looking down onto people because they're up so high um, but you know where they are located central to the house set back from the edges of the dwelling they can be successful in demonstrating that there's no overlooking um, so yeah. So my question was along the same line given that um, the um, recommendation before us today is to refuse uh, to accept it without a rooftop terrace accept the application without a rooftop terrace and the applicant had a rooftop terrace and you've suggested there may be some uh, latitude there or compromise of, of where that rooftop terrace goes to prevent that overlooking. Uh, what, is the, what is the capacity from here for council to ne negotiate uh, the outcomes of that rooftop terrace? I think you just answered that in saying that, that, that because it's of the nature of the application, there is still, still scope for... Yeah. So that roof, even though we've refused the, the element of the rooftop terrace yeah. in, in this, there's still room to negotiate. Yeah. Well, um, they can go through the negotiated decision process, make representation to their conditions. Um, officers can also ask a question of the applicant between now and the ordering meeting mm. um, and let you know the answer to that too. Um, so would that require a deferral motion again like we did with the previous one or is that something we can refuse and still get a, get a response from the applicant before our Thursday's meeting? Yeah, I think either option would be valid for council. That's, that's, that's your choice. Look, yeah, look, we've got a staff recommendation before us. I'm going to move the staff recommendation. Yeah, second approved, second Morrison. Look, we've gone round and round on this. Um, we've got hydraulic engineers report, a geotechnical expert report. This is compliant with the scheme. It's consistent with legal advice. Uh, it is prudent to, and I wholly support the staff in their um, recommendation of removing the rooftop terrace. There's significant privacy issues. Um, in relation to the neighbours and I think that it and a rooftop terrace when you're on the beach my question would be why do you need a rooftop terrace because you've used a, a there anyway but the main concern is the privacy and amenity of the surrounding properties so I support that and I support the staff recommendation. Thank you Councillor Sorkin. Councillor Sorkin, motion. Councillor Sorkin, if you want to bring up the again. Um, I have a very different view. Um, I did foreshadow I was going to seek further advice from staff, but I think just the advice we've got, that's maybe uh, putting staff on necessary time. Um, my view is that the level of non-compliance and discretion required with the performance outcomes is such that it shouldn't be supported. If you look there, the um, performance outcome clearly says that uh, any 
protrusion into the coastal building line should be cantilevered deck um, uh, and uncovered. And it should be unenclosed and uncovered. Well, what we've got here. Yeah, it's contra contradictory. <laughs> yeah. Um, Remind that for the scheme of Emma Patrick. Gee, uh, <laughs> it's consistent with that. <laughs> um, what we've got is a bedroom, a kitchen, and a living room. And we've heard that it may not have any structural impact. But the reason that we did that, I have clear memories when we put that provision in, it was very specifically debated. Because we had to come back, because we hadn't finished the chat, we were going to have a different set of regulations uh, and requirements that went out with the first advertised draft and we said no we'll need to finish the chat and then redo it. The reason we did that was if as is probable during the life of this time we have a one and a hundred year event it will erode back to where the piles are and that's you're going to have a bedroom a living room and a kitchen with the potential for public access to leave beneath, beneath them. Is that what we want to encourage? Is the level of discretion where we're saying, well, yeah, the site's steep, so we're going to let you forget about the front setbacks. Oh, it's sloping, so we'll let you forget about the height limit. And oh, it, it's the, the um, historically, we've let people do it down the road, so we'll let you do it. Is that the precedent we want to set for the first application <coughs> under the 2020 NUSA plan for treating coastal hazards? For me, the answer is no. Now, I, I respect the staff have done an assessment and say, when they look at elsewhere, that it's not inconsistent. Can't argue with that. But, so what's Crawley? There are a lot of decisions in the past that I would not have supported, and we have a new plan which has specific requirements. One of them is that forward the coastal building line, you have an uncovered deck. Now, what does that mean? If we, are we going to access this from the view of the applicant? Are we going to assess it from the view of the community? If that was a deck rather than a, a building structure, would that look better or worse from the beach? And remember, we did a really good bit of work around the cost-benefit analysis on this, and it was based on the value of the beach. And you can remember the value that came back for the beach was incredibly high. And so the scenic amenity and the beach views are incredibly high. And what's more, this is right beside a public access way. So rather than having a deck for that park, that public access is always going to have appearance of block. So to me, the building is too large for the block. Plain and simple. Now we can argue that, yes, precedent under previous schemes, previous state planning positions may be different. But we're not considering it under those previous schemes, we're considering it under the current scheme. <coughs> and the current scheme says forward the building line, you have a deck. And while we don't have a lot of vacant blocks left with oceanfront blocks, we have a lot of houses that could be redeveloped. And if this is a precedent you want to set for oceanfront, you approve it. If it's not the precedent you want to set, don't. Mr. Chair, is that so? Do we have an alternate motion on, on the table, or is that no. speaking to mine? I'm um, speaking to yours. No, I, yes. <laughs> okay, I've got a question. Um, uh, Councillor Stockwell said that we let the people down the road um, get have have it um, their plans approved. Well, we didn't, did we? We actually refused it, and then they took us to court. And can you speak to to that, of, 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 or your ability at least, and what yeah. you can say? Yeah, so I think it's it's relevant for us to consider the one down the road, 54 CV Terrace. Um, council did refuse it. Um, officers recommended refusal. Um, we were concerned about this dwelling going in an area that was going to be subject to future coastal erosion processes. Now, that was under the 2006 scheme. Um, this application is under the 2020-20 scheme. Um, but the issue is, we ended up settling the appeal for 54 Seaview Terrace based on the legal advice and the expert opinion at the time. And, and that really was that the design, the footings, the extensive footings and the work they had done demonstrated that it addressed the issue of this coastal building line, that it was really only an arbitrary line. 
Um, yes, the 2006 scheme only ever envisaged a deck as well in the coastal building line, but um, the 54 CV Terrace had half the house in the coastal building line. Not just a cantilevered section, it had foundation in there. Now, we're, we're recommending the council agree to this one, essentially because the planning scheme requirements have not changed around this between the 2006 scheme and the 2020 scheme. It's almost the exact same wording, certainly the same meaning. It still says dwellings should be located outside the coastal building line with only a cantilever deck. So we're, we're finding ourselves in a very similar, if not the same position to 54 mm. CV Terrace. And I think we need to learn from um, those appeals we've had in the past. And that's why officers have recommended us. Um, if we want a different outcome, we actually need to change the planning scheme, take what we've learned through the chat process and introduce new and additional requirements. And that's what will give us a different outcome, if that's what we're looking for. Thank you. Joe, I'll take that advice to heart. Um, it seems that uh, um, the use of the word the coastal building line, which is an arbitrary line and not, not relevant uh, in the current planning scheme, is something that we need to need to address. We've done <coughs> additional work with regard to 2040, 2070 and 2100 um, in coastal hazard adaptation plan, but we need to uh, need to make that amendment. So I'm not prepared to um, um, override uh, the staff decision in this case. It comes uh, well considered and uh, and well documented, and uh, the options there for uh, the rooftop terrace uh, have been noted. So I'm prepared to support the staff recommendation in this case. Thank you, Joe. Just to clarify something. Um, the coastal building line does have relevance. Can you explain what it is and how it's, what, what legalities sit around the coastal building line? Okay, so the coastal building line is based on the Beach Protection Authority old line that was drawn in the 80s. And it it's based on the best science at that time. Um, so our planning scheme, 2006 and the 2020 scheme, adopted that line because that's, that's the best we had at the time in terms of trying to set a line to say buildings should be behind that line. Um, so that's, that's really where it comes from. But we've got a lot more information now that we've finished the chat. <coughs> and it's, it's, I guess, suggesting there's a greater risk to these sites than the coastal building line. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, the councillors wish to speak to motions. Uh, I'm happy to support staff recommendation um, and support also the um, amended um, requirement which deletes the rooftop terrace. Thank you. I just, I just have a question. How does then removing the rooftop terrace play into the coastal erosion plan? Like how is how are those two marrying when the amendment today is that the plans must remove the rooftop terrace? How do those two speak to each other? Well, the application is for a house in the coastal area. Mm. Um, the rooftop terrace is just one element which we're asking the, the applicant to remove because of our concerns about overlooking. The roof terrace really doesn't have any implications for coastal erosion processes. Mm. They're really unrelated. Mm. Look, I'll be supporting the, the motion before us. Um, uh, I think some of the points raised by Councillor Stockwell speak to a debate that's yet to be had in the future and uh, um, may be the subject of debate concerning the future planning scheme amendments, and we're just not there yet. Uh, I, I respect and support the, the change to the conditions that remove the rooftop terrace overlooking and privacy issues generally are uh, an issue of, of genuine concern for residents across the Shire, not only uh, the neighbours to the north of this property. Uh, um, I thank the staff for their diligence in going back and, and doing on-ground assessment of that. And um, I accept at this point that you know, the, the scheme mentions a preference for unenclosed cantilever balconies. The purpose, going to the intent of that is, is to prevent blockage of views on the neighbouring properties and as we've heard from staff, the, the in enclosed cantilever balconies do not impede on the views of the neighbours in any way. 
So for that, for that reason, I'm um, happy to support this, um, this motion. Some question, John. Just in relation to that point, it may not impede on the, the views of the neighbour as it currently stands, but does it potentially impact on the future development for, uh, of the adjoining block on the views that they could have? Um, well, they'll always be able to see straight out um, to the rear. But the um, element of the balconies being enclosed is about the side views. Yeah, so in the, in the, in the current in the current situation, no, they're not going to impact on views, but um, if the neighbours were to to develop, I, I presume that they would seek to get a, a similar outcome to this. So is there no consideration of the future needs of the uh, of the adjoining block with regard to that same consideration? Is it their potential to develop? Um, it's, it's, it's not particularly relevant to the planning scheme um, because the the current situation is such that uh, it's, it's, it, there's, no, there's no loss of use. You've really got to consider what the current impacts are. Yeah. All right, okay. Councillor Stockwell. Sure. Just a clarifying question by the Council of Jurisdiction and Council Wilkie have suggested that the cantilevering uh, provisions of the scheme relate uh, purely to uh, the views from the neighbouring block. Does the scheme say that? The cantilevering um, is about coastal erosion processes and views. But the, the, the expert reports have addressed the coastal erosion processes. Um, so that, that issue's been really dealt with. So then that leaves the visual aspect to consider. And, to and it's not just, from, not just from the neighbouring block, it's also from the beach? If it's you also from the beach. The That's correctly. right. Yep. Anyone else wish to speak before Councillor Stewart closes? Thank you. Uh, Joe? No? I think it's all been said. Thank you, Councillor Wilkie. I think it's all been said. Um, I think it's, we, we, as I said, we've got expert reports, hydraulic engineers, geotechnical experts. I think that the issues of privacy, which was a great concern, have been addressed with the removal of the roof terrace, and I'm happy to support the staff recommendation. All in favour? And that's Councillor Wedner, Lawrence, and Jerusalem, Denzel, Stewart, Wilkie against. Councillor Stockwell, the motion's carried. Councillor Sam, um, we're going to put like two hours mm. for to the short agenda for comfort.
getting what he wants because he said he's not spending any more money. Anybody here he wants? All right, councillors, we're back. And the meeting open again. Well to item five, page 29 of the General Committee agenda. It's a further report, an MCU, for a minor change to development approval for commercial Mooseville. We have Kerry. Kerry, are you able to give us an overview of this? Yeah. So back in July, uh, there was a report presented to the Planning and Environment Committee um, recommending refusal of an application for a change to a development approval um, to allow increased height of an approved building to go essentially from 10 metres to around 12 metres. Um, it was there were other uh, design changes also made. There was a reduction in eaves and balcony widths and a few other bits and pieces that were proposed to change. That application was recommended for refusal essentially because the increased height did not contribute to the building's um, building appearance and really was no justification for, for the increased height. Um, the scheme sets um, a maximum height of the area of 10 metres. Their building was going over tw just up slightly over 12 metres. Um, at the uh, last round of council meetings in July, council wanted to give the applicant an opportunity to do a presentation to councillors, so uh, to ensure that we, they had a chance to step through the plans with councillors and put for, for their grounds as to why they thought there was some merit in the proposal. Uh, that's occurred, um, so the applicant was given that opportunity, their plans were stepped through and some, a chance for councillors to ask, ask some questions. Um, one of those questions put forward by one of the councillors was to, would, had they considered uh, providing staff accommodation on the site, given uh, the very real housing crisis they have and businesses struggling to um, attract staff because it's difficult to find affordable accommodation in Noosa. Um, the applicant subsequently went away and considered that and they gave us some amended plans showing um, some staff accommodation, which sat behind essentially the medical building on top of the, the uh, car park at the rear. Um, they were looking at a total of nine units. Um, they then met with officers to discuss that plan. Um, and officers um, indicated that one, um, that sort of change to the approval would require a new application. It wasn't considered a minor change because they were introducing a new use on the site. Um, officers were also concerned about the location of the staff accommodation because it backs on to industrial uses um, and their design really provided no sort of private open space or amenity provisions for, for staff living in there. Um, the applicant through that process took that on board but also noted it's not something they really want to do anyway. Um, they're not really interested in doing it. It creates operational issues for them in trying to get separate access to a staff quarters that are not coming in through the main entrance. It creates some security issues. It's not something they want to consider. Mm. Um, so they, they've looked at it, come back and said um, no, essentially. Um, so this report really just details that process um, and recommends again that um, the application be refused because um, the increased height is really not warranted. Um, the applicant did agree to make some design changes, increasing the width of the balconies and the eaves somewhat, not to the full extent of the original plans, but um, did um, make some design changes, which were an improvement to the plans that were seen in July's meeting. Um, but the application is still recommended for refusal. The increased height is not warranted. It does not contribute to a better building form and it's not consistent with the scheme requirements. Thank you, Karen. Questions? Anyone care to move the motion? Happy to move the motion. Move, Councillor Lawrenson. Have a second, please. Councillor Wegner. Councillor Lawrenson. I um, don't want to add any more to what Kerry said. I just um, support the staff recommendation for a refusal for the reasons already outlined. Right. I'd like to say I'm against just for consistency to pay me, but I'm not.
Councillors know we've just received advice that um, an appeal by Sykes for Ross Crescent, it was a two lot subdivision that came before council, um, a straight state directed refusal. Mm. Um, the applicant has advised us that they're withdrawing the appeal. Was the coastal building line an element there? No, the coastal building loan wasn't, um, but it was refused because um, the property is subject to coastal erosion processes. So it's not considered an appropriate property to create in the first instance because of those issues. Thank you, Kerry. Yeah, they wanted to cut the property into two, make an extra, a new sellable lot right above the beach down. Yes. I remember. I'm just trying to remember the plot. Oh, that was right there. Yeah, I remember. Right 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 oh, I remember. You had a special yeah. meeting about it. Remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't remember. We, it we were directed by the state to refuse it. Next item is lifeguard services request for quotation assessment page 44. Board of Directors Greenwood, page 44 of the General Committee agenda. Welcome, Ken. Okay, hello. Yes, Amelia. I come to Robinson in all the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of <coughs> interest in this matter as my daughter, Georgia Robinson, and my son, Ben Robinson are employed by Surf Life Saving Queensland as casual lifeguards. It could be viewed that I have a conflict of interest, however, I do not believe a reasonable person would have a perception of lives as my daughter's and son's employment is of a casual nature and not exclusively bound to SLSQ. Therefore, there is no benefit nor is it or loss specific to my daughter and son from the outcome of this application. Therefore, I will choose to remain in the meeting room. However, I will respect the decision of the meeting on whether I can remain and participate <coughs> in the decision. Kathy, I suggest you'd have to move the A at, as a casual lifeguards, as it appears now, because it's now two. So. It's now two. Um, I'll move. Councillor Stewart? I'll second. Yeah, I'll move that. No, Councillor Pinzel. Councillor, no, <coughs> the declared conflict of interest by Councillor Lawrenston. And determined that council note the declarable conflict of interest by Councillor Lawrence and determined that it is in the public interest that Councillor Lawrence participates and votes in this matter. Because council believes that a reasonable person would not have a perception of bias because Councillor Lawrence nor her children stand to receive a personal benefit or loss in relation to this matter, and therefore a reasonable person would trust that the final decision is made in the public interest. Oh, right. Anyone else wish to speak to the motion? Uh, all in favour? That is, every, every councillor except Councillor Lawrence. So unanimous, but Councillor Lawrence did not vote. So that's carried. Thank you. Please. Welcome. Yes. It's a bit of an overview of the elements of this report yep. that we have before us, please. Yep. Um, you'll recall um, in June 2022, uh, there was a report to Council about a request for quotation for the provision of lifeguard services, and that was for that. Um, RFQ to be issued to Surf Life Saving Queensland on the basis that they were the, the only entity capable of providing the service. Um, so that RFQ has since gone out to Surf Life Saving Queensland. Uh, they've provided responses, responses um, to the RFQ. Uh, that was assessed under uh, due diligence and probity and um, so there's a number of options canvassed in the report, but the, the one that the council officers at least are recommending is option three, uh, which is an increase to the current value of the contract, which includes uh, new service levels in that um, price as well. Um, a part of the change is it's also recommended that the uh, labour component of the, of the new agreement is indexed to Fair Work Commission. Um, as opposed to CPI, which the current contract is. So the, it, in effect, there would be uh, fair work um, for labour <coughs> and CPI still for equipment and consumables. So the report is recommending that we enter into the <coughs> contract at the new price 
for 10 years, or five years with, and a five year option, I should say. Questions, councillors? I'm happy to move it. Move Councillor Stewart, second to Councillor Pinzel. Clear. Okay, thank you. Um, Look, thank you very much, Cliff, for your hard work on this. I think the option that staff have proposed is an excellent one. Uh, it increases the current agreement value by 10% as the preferred option um, because the proposed service levels increase and they will develop collaborative <coughs> with SLSQ. And it adopts a risk-based approach while minimising rate payer impact as per page 44 of our agenda. I looked at the comparison of what the current contract has been negotiated under, i.e. increases in line with CPI. And if we stick to this model, we are incurring $134,670 increase in cost to our rate payer with no increase in service levels. However, if we renegotiate with annual increases indexed to Fair Work Commission wage rises and service levels determined in collaboration with SLSQ, then our increase in cost is $151,188 to our rate payer. But we have an increase in service levels that has been agreed collaboratively. So for an extra sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars $17,000, we're having a significant amount of increased services uh, because we have changed the way we're negotiating and well done to Clinton and the team on that. That's all correct, isn't it? Clint? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, it also indexation of SLSQ wage mm -hmm. rises to the Fair Work Commission model provides SLSQ with more business confidence and the ability to provide counsel with an initial 110000 saving in comparison to indexation to CPI. But most significantly, what the service levels do is they uh, provide more safety for our community, our residents, our tourists. The most important thing for us as a council is to keep our community safe and increase lifesavers and increase services in regard to lifesavers on our beaches for longer periods will certainly assist with that. So I'm very happy to support the staff recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. And one more couple of questions, Clint. Um, in terms of increased services, um, I know that we had you know, uh, a few options where we could have, have provided more services. Um, I'm referring to the annual report, the Australian Lifeguard Annual Report 2021-2022, and um, on page 16 is some really good stats. <coughs> Rescues 260, total attendance on the beach 3,636,000, preventative actions nearly 50,000, first aid treatments 6,700, and local laws and public relations interactions about 87,000. <coughs> My question is, have we um, negotiated in collaboration with SLSQ um, it is 10% enough is really what, what I'm asking. Should we, given those numbers, um, have we provided enough in terms of <coughs> services? Uh, through the chair, councillor, that, that would include the lifeguards and clubs? No, that's separate. Just lifeguards, is it? That's just lifeguards. Okay. I have different stats for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, look, as I've indicated there on page 49 of of the report, I thought it was important. We went out with prescribed service levels there, but obviously when you go out and request for quote, you don't collaborate beforehand, agree on the service levels before you go out. So uh, where, we've, where we've landed here, this option three, we went into quite a detailed process afterwards with the service providers, SLSQ, to determine the appropriate service levels. Now, uh, and that was a pretty, um, full-on discussion. Oh, it was a good. Yeah. It was a very um, collegiate discussion. But we went through each beach, each season, uh, each you know for for, for the each um, <coughs> location. So I'm I'm fairly comfortable with it. Look, I think that does it. Can you say that it fully addresses every risk that you will? No, it won't account for a random drowning. It, it won't you know along the, the eastern beaches, for example. It may not um, account for or stop a drowning at Noosa Main Beach, but what we've gone through is the, we've looked at all the risk areas, and and those across <coughs> every beach and across every season they vary quite a lot. So, and you'll see, for example, Sunshine Beach, we identified, you know, a, dent, a, a risk area there of uh, more hours being required at this, in the Christmas holidays. That risk does not exist at other beaches. So it's, it's specific to each beach <coughs> and seasonal. Now, I'm very happy with the process we went through with Surf Life Saving Queensland because it was 
the, the contract manager going through the service levels with the provider. Now, at a personal level, I happen to know a fair bit about the service, so I'm very comfortable where we've gone there. Ticks two boxes in terms of mitigating as much as you can about future risk in a reasonable way, but also identifying <coughs> that, um, you know, mitigating the impact to ratepayers financially as well. So, uh, I'm, as a contract manager, I'm very comfortable with uh, the proposal. And it's also <coughs> identified that every beach, and that identifies that every beach has picked up, has been tweaked, has picked up something. So I thought that that was quite important too. No, I think that's excellent. <coughs> um, in terms of very, very uh, variations, if <coughs> do we have a bit of buffer um, that if high levels of services are required on certain beaches, um, do we have the flexibility to increase those levels of services? Uh, you mean I'm a at a, on a seasonal basis? On a seasonal or, basis, yeah. yeah. Well, look, there is, and that's through our, if there was an emerging need, we would address that via the budget review process. So we have our monthly meetings, and we have a pretty close relationship. So if there was an emerging need where there was a problem, yeah. they would come to me with evidence, i.e. crowd stats, incidents, rescues, and whatever else. <coughs> and then we would assess that evidence, and that would form part of a budget review process if it meant that there were further funds required. So that would that'd be your normal process. Fantastic. Um, <coughs> in terms of every beach getting increased services, um, I think that's just terrific. Um, in particular, Noosa West again, when I look at the stats. Mm. Um, oh yeah, um, okay, questions. I keep that one for commentary. Um, question. In terms of the draft lifeguard agreement for the provision of lifeguard services, um, can you give an overview of what additional clauses or what, what's different with this agreement compared to past agreements? Yeah, I can't through the chair. Councillor, the, the first agreement was mostly about a transitioning away from council run service to a contractor being SLSQ. So it was a lot of transition clauses um, a lot of industrial relations clauses, maintenance of, of wages and whatever else. All of that's been taken out you now because it no longer needs, needs to be there. So the agreement now, and the agreement before was a very comprehensive document. This one's probably more so. It was a very good document the first time around, but you learn more as you go along. And SLSQ have more needs and, and things evolve. So the, the, the document's more comprehensive. It all also covers off on um, policy matters as well, so there's additional policies in terms of best practice around uh, that we're requiring from Surf Lifesaving Queensland around, um, you know, code of conduct, um, <coughs> drugs and alcohol abuse, discouragement, zero tolerance, harassment, bullying, uh, uh, domestic violence and human rights as well. So that's a contemporary approach. Mm. So. Uh, and all of those changes have been discussed with Surf Life Saving. The document, the agreement was part of the RFQ that went out. <coughs> so there's no real issues around that because it's contemporary and it's what you would expect mm. from a modern workforce. <coughs> uh, the other exactly. aspects to that as well, so obviously those things are through inductions uh, and regular training as council officers would do, whether it be through take fives or periodic refresher training. Um, the Parts that stay the same are still about the reporting that's required, the meetings, um, the, the amount of parameters that they need to, to abide by. Um, but mostly it was around modernising the agreement and, and just making it fit, suit our needs and, and the contractor's needs. Um, fantastic. Um, and probably just one more matter in terms of lifeguard participation in community um, <coughs> in community type roundtables. Uh, are there provisions in the agreement that um, encourage more involvement of lifeguards in community matters, such as destination management, the World Surfing Reserve, Surf Community Alliance, looking at maybe the provision <coughs> of local laws, bathing reserve? 
um, does the agreement give our lifeguards the opportunity to participate in those sorts of discussions? Uh, through the chair, councillor, it's a yes and no. Yeah. Um, some of those things you would expect, I would expect as the contract manager for those things to occur. So if we're looking at the the lifeguards have an obligation to, to um, undertake local laws duties. So through our reporting process, if there are issues with local laws and whatever, we would we would get that feedback and we would consult. Things like the, the surfing reserve, we know that that's happening anyway. It's not really a contractual matter in terms of sitting in this agreement, but Surf Life Saving Queensland, given that they're a key stakeholder on the beach, whether it be through the surf clubs, through the affiliated surf clubs, or just being as a good corporate citizen, will we'll be involved in those things anyway. So some of those matters need not sit formally in here, um, but there is a place there is a place for them because this is about <coughs> this agreement is primarily about the services that ratepayers are funding. So it's feet in the sand, lifeguards and the associated well the ancillary services that are provided <coughs> and and how via the equipment and whatever else. Okay. So does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Just so a yes or no. Yeah. Yeah. Second question. Just triggered by a, a series of questions. What powers do lifeguards have, if any, uh, in relation to local laws? Can well, you give us some examples, please? <coughs> the local laws empower lifeguards in any regard? Uh, well, they're authorised, they authorised officers on behalf of council, but primarily local, local laws, like if there are um, uh, local law breaches, they have powers to undertake. <coughs> And, and do certain things. Um, generally, when you've got a local law infringement issue, if it's if it's if it's a chronic matter, um, you would um, get council officers to assist, local laws officers to assist. I'm thinking of dogs off leash on a beach, for example. Um, well, well, there is there. Uh, you would expect that lifeguards would would address address that matter. Primarily, primarily though, councillor, their their powers relate to the bathing reserve, yep. which is the water base <coughs> thing. So what, what we're also asking the agreement is that if there are other local law matters that come up that they don't sit idly by, if there is capacity, for example, uh, what I wouldn't expect is if there's uh, a drowning occurring or whatever else or major issues out in the water that the lifeguards are not prioritising a dog off lead when the bread and butter of the whole service is out on the water, right? So their yeah. bathing reserve yeah. is, their main, is their main power. <coughs> I guess it would come surprise to some people that, that faces the question, do life, are lifeguards empowered to address issues such as dogs or bleed on the beach? Uh, my answer to that would be yes, to an extent, yeah. yes. Okay, thank you. Right, um, <coughs> Councillor Stewart's yeah. spoken to the, the motion. Any other councillors which speak to the motion? Oh, oh, I'll make it brief. Um, Again, just quoting some stats, there were no lives lost between the SLSQ red and yellow flags this season. There was one drowning deep in the Nusa region and one beach-related coastal drowning. Um, money spent on lifeguard services is <coughs> money very well spent. Um, I really look forward to the next five years on building our relationship with the SLSQ and like to acknowledge SLSQ's commitment to continuous improvement and, um, and also for um, embracing best practice. And I'm going to talk about this because it's something dear to me, um, domestic violence and family violence. Um, SLSQ had employees, both male and female, but also a really large organisation. Um, I encourage that the contract provides recommendations that re regarding training for domestic and family violence programs. Um, it's important that we in council play our, our part to create a society where violence has no place. Um, so thank you, Clint, in your efforts in this space and 
um, everything else you do in this space. I think I firsthand know your relationship with our lifeguards um, and how you've always got their back. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you as well as SLSQ. Um, you know, our beaches are our most valuable assets and above that actually sits our people. So um, thank you. Mm. Uh, Joe, Karen? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, our most valuable assets. One of the reasons is that we've got a very good service that provides uh, a service to our community and, uh, and our visitors. And I've uh, embraced the uh, enhancements of this, uh, this contract and the elements of new technology that SLSQ uh, endeavour to do and to uh, for the quality of the service they deliver and uh, <coughs> the ongoing uh, improvements that they try to uh, uh, adapt. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, just to add on to that, I think it's fantastic, uh, Clint and the team, for the, the process. It's been rigorous and you've brought us out through the other side. Um, and it's fantastic. And yeah, we want to thank LSQ also for their um, collaboration in this and um, to provide, you know, service levels that are required. But also I love that it's indexed to the fair work. I think, we, you know, we want to project that we are a contemporary um, organisation and that we want to align ourselves with other organisations that also work towards a future where there's zero tolerance to violence, where there's opportunity for workplaces to be able to firstly recognise there might be issues and they can come around that person and um, assist through good best work practice. I love the idea of good governance, that we've used a leadership style that um, aligns with what's coming up in our next agenda item with um, enterprise risk and opportunity. And I think that's been really addressed. You've shown good governance and leadership and around the table today. We've also you know, agreed with that and can recognise that this rigorous pro process aligned with a good collaborative approach um, and a leadership style that's contemporary um, sets us in good steep for the next 10 years. I like the idea that you can come together and um, you'll revisit the contract and you know it's able to be flexible and adaptable. So I think this is a great um, collaborative approach where we'd like to see our leadership heading in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. Tom. Oh, I'd just like to say, yeah, thanks Clint and the team. I know that <coughs> your, your reports to the council have been very good and we're just lucky to have you there. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. I was just going to say that you know, we have moved away from the council model um, of provision uh, to a more efficient, cost effective. Um, mm. You know, some of those old council lifeguards have shown they've got management potential, yeah, especially down the jail. Yeah. yeah, I thought you were talking about this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you said what I think. I'd just like to take the opportunity to uh, recognise the work not the lifeguards, they're often the unsung heroes, the volunteer lifesavers get a lot of uh, focus and, and appreciation, and rightly so. But it's actually the lifeguards that are there every week of the year, not just during the season. <coughs> so I just want to acknowledge the professional work that they do. Thank you, Clint. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just th again thank you, Clint, and um, all the team and SLSQ. Um, I think this is a, a, a great um, report, and yeah, really value all your hard work. Thank you. All in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Clint. <coughs> Next item is enterprise risk and opportunity management policy, and with our governance manager Diana Stewart. Welcome, Diana. Hello. <laughs> Can you just give us a uh, bit of an overview yep. of this policy, the right. significance of this policy, and is it related to any recent awards that the council had? <laughs> 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 Dorothy Dixon. Bugger. Sorry. We're not allowed to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. LGAQ. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so let's begin. <laughs> so today I'm presenting the new Enterprise Risk and Opportunity Management Policy and essentially managing risk and opportunity is all part of good leadership. 
and governance for our council and I've been heartened to hear that you're all applying it today when you're Yay. talking in your discussion, so well done. Um, so it's an important component of our culture here um, where risks and opportunities are considered and managed consistently across council and this is what this will do. And just as a bit of background and context, we currently have a council adopted risk management policy that was created in 2014. And then since then, in 2019, an internal audit on risk management was completed, and that's where our journey started. It identified areas of improvement, including um, that we need to align further to the ISO risk management standard of 31,000 um, 31, on risk management. And so since then, since the audit, as a council, we've been on this continuous improvement journey of a couple of years, basically, and you've all been a part of that journey at some stage, where we've undertaken extensive <coughs> consultation, testing with teams on the ground, and <coughs> amending the policies and frameworks and documents and tools to make sure that um, the changes <coughs> we make are really fit for purpose for our council. Um, so this is included, just as a recap, um, you know, uh, workshops with the executive team and it's been numerous workshops to get to a level of comfort where we stand with our <coughs> policy and our, um, especially our risk appetite tolerances and levels. Um, we also got expert advice through this process through Insura and other <coughs> firms. We sought ideas as well from our network of risk and um, governance professionals across South East Queensland. So, you know, we didn't just do this in isolation. We actually tried to figure out what other areas and councils are doing and, and see what we can adjust to. And then we workshopped, obviously, with you guys, the concepts as well, and you've been a part of that journey, which has been fantastic, and um, your feedback has been incorporated into this version. So the proposed policy is our end product of this. Um, it's been recently also reviewed and endorsed just recently at our Audit and Risk Committee in August, <coughs> and they've been quite comfortable and pleased with the final draft too. Um, so key changes in a nutshell include new risk management principles, which we didn't have before. We were really missing some of those kind of fundamental elements um, that shows to our community how we align to the ISO standard and how those risk principles <coughs> apply to us and what they mean to our council. So they're in this new version as well. Um, and then you'll see a huge component of this is our strategic risk appetite and tolerance levels within the document. I must stress that this is a guide only at that strategic top level, but it gives our community and our staff mm. a really good anchoring and foundation to understand against each of the mm -hmm. criteria, where are we comfortable, what do we tolerate, what do we not tolerate, um, and, and you know what are our key top level um, statements that we as a council endorse. So that's in there as well. Um, and then finally, clearer roles and responsibilities as well that really carve out, um, especially for our staff, you know, from the leadership level down to the council officer, what is everyone responsible for? Mm. And um, I guess in that, that's how we build and embed risk and opportunity into our culture with our staff too, um, throughout, through all this. Um, so, in a nutshell, this policy will help us get to the next level of maturity and compliance and we're ready for it as an organisation. It will strengthen our governance practices and importantly, it will guide our staff on the expectations and the active role and responsibility in this space. And to be honest, I've just been heartened today where I've been attending a couple of operational team meetings where they're already starting to pilot this and grapple with it in, in, t in teams <coughs> and areas of work. So you will start to see the fruits of all this coming up to your level for consideration. And so finally, um, as part of that document, uh, the report as well, how are we going to roll this out? So our future plans include further training and implementation of the policy across council. We're going to do that in a bit of a, um, I guess, a multifaceted approach. Um, we're also going to get the support of our insurer to come on that journey with us to run some sessions with our staff and to make sure that they understand how risks and opportunities are considered across the council and how they can start to use it um, in their teams. Uh, and all that will essentially, at the end of the day, help us deliver effective and efficient um, services to our community, which is what all this is about, really. Mm. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Questions, councillors? Problem. You just tweaked the thing there when you talked about with your insurers. So yes. 
have we got the dialogue going with our stewards about Absolutely. how to reduce the premiums because we're putting in place <laughs> effective risk management? <laughs> Premiums is a separate <laughs> <laughs> discussion. <laughs> oh, it's just a, I've been involved in organisations where we've done just that. Yep. They put in the regular update and we said, wait a minute, you said these are the risks, we've addressed these risks. And the premium came down. Quite a lot. An example. So I, I think it is part of that discussion. If we're going to prove question. that we're. Yeah, so the question is answered. <laughs> well, uh, oh, sorry, oh, I was going to just add, um, we do get a rebate from our insurer for completing and showing that we are keeping our risks down and managed appropriately. So in a sense, they are rewarding us for, um, you know, ensuring that uh, across council we're doing the right thing and, and trying to keep the risks in control. Did we not have an example of that with the... Uh, the um, OH&S, improve, improvements in OH&S from the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Yeah, and they do work closely with us on, on these kinds of topics and they are aware of it and every year they ask more and more questions. So, um, you know, they refine that with us um, and also pick up gaps too where we need to be aware. So, yeah. Do we have more and more answers? <laughs> <laughs> it takes longer and longer to respond. <laughs> Um, oh, just a question. In terms of reporting, the reports that come to council, yes. um, Diana, is it possible, it'd be great um, to understand whether or not the recommendations <coughs> that are coming forward are consistent with our risk appetite? Is there an opportunity maybe to include um, a government <coughs> section where you guys just tick off or, you know, yep. middle ground? And, um, because... It's, really, it's part of the decision making process. <coughs> yeah, I think um, through through the chair, um, we will be um, we will be looking at that next. Um, okay. uh, it's going to be part of our, I guess, report improvement. Um, yes. We do need to look at other elements of compliance, and risk is one of them. So um, we will be strengthening that part. Um, yeah, prompting staff to have to do that as part of that decision making and assessment process. So you've got comfort. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, anyone care to make a motion? I'm happy to Councillor Pinzel, have a second please. Councillor Stewart. Councillor Pinzel. Yeah, look, I'm happy to support this. It's fantastic because it, it um, encapsulates everything we want to do um, and align with our corporate plan, which we're going to be working on to, in, you know, specifically around engendering trust in our community. The report today, you know, is really exciting to think, you know, that we can align and move forward to a future where you know, we can have excellence in council and um, I want to thank you and your team for your work that you've done. Um, we want to um, proceed forward to strengthen and overcome, you know, those risks and prioritise and identify early so that we've got continuous improvement and a response. And we also get then the benefit, like you said, back to, you know, insurance and different things like that. So I think it's really great because it shows us that we are heading towards being efficient we're trying to be, you know, projecting forward to the future. What does this organisation need? Um, and I love the idea of training and implementation and how that's going to be a guided process for the staff through the organisation. So I think all of that builds continuity, um, builds confidence moving forward. And I'm particularly interested, as always, in the human rights element of that um, and how that we carefully consider the rights of as all, of all and the people in our community and that we strive to be leaders in that space and... Um, we can have confidence that um, we are ticking all the boxes across a broad range of you know expectations for contemporary leadership. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pinson. Anyone else wish to speak? Um, um, you can, okay. Continued improvements in good governance. Thank you. And mine will, thank be, you. Just, mine will be just <laughs> as fast. Um, you know, every decision we make here in council has, and I. I like the word risk, but I like the word opportunity better. So this is, as a councillor, um, really supports or guides me in my decision making. Thank you. I see. Correct. Um, yeah, thank you, um, Diana. I just want to reiterate what all my other fellow councillors have said. Um, it aligns with the corporate plan, plan and continue good governance. Easier to read, simple and self-explanatory. I like how you share the levels of risk that council and council councillors are prepared to undertake in regard to a number of activities. 
I think it demonstrates our value system and what are considered priorities for this council. For yeah. example, safety of our staff and the community must always come first. That's why we have an appetite level or risk in this area at zero when it comes to health and safety. Yeah. Similarly, it is zero to minimal when it comes to legal issues and compliance, the environment and <coughs> cyber security. So I think that was really well set out and easy to read. Um, so thank you and thank you for a great report and all your hard work in this space. Yeah. Thank you too. Thank yeah, you. I'd like to thank you also for taking on board the council feedback during the workshop. Well, well, Mr. Chair, that, that's the uh, let me just sorry, cancel things. So my apologies. Oh. That was Council Stewart and moved it. My apologies. Yeah. I read Council Stewart. Sorry, I read Council Stewart. My, my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, how you took on board the council feedback in the workshop and we were all grappling with the concept of risk appetite <clears> and, <throat> and, um, and the. The final product reflects our understanding, which needs to be simple. Mm. Uh, uh, and I think if, if, if we can understand it, then staff certainly can understand mm. it. So thank you for taking on board our feedback during that workshop. My apologies, Chair. I thought you'd ask the, the Mayor to, uh, to, to close. No, that's all. My apologies. Thank you. Um, uh, Tom, did you wish to speak before the Mayor? No, 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 Councillor Finzel. Oh, Finzel, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Councillor Finzel. I swear he said No, I think it's all been said. Yes, okay, thank, thank you. you. All in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, darling. Next item is item 8, Burgess Creek Coastal Erosion and Water Quality. Now we have a staff member zooming in. Amy Kimber is online. Um, Amelia, do you have it? I'll, I'll move the motion and we'll get an amendment. Um, oh, sure, amendment. you should move a motion. Yep. A change motion. Yeah. A change motion. Change motion. Okay, so Amelia's I'm happy to second. Seconded by Councillor Finzel. Perhaps you read out the changes, please, Amelia. Um, change to C, I've just added some extra reporting. Um, request the CEO or delegate to liaise with Unity Water to provide Unity Water's receiving environment monitoring program and all routine monitoring reports, including water quality and quantity discharges from Burgess Creek to council environment staff to support council's integrated water quality monitoring program for Noosa Shire. And the law. Oh, um, the reason I added that was um, that I've been told that this bit of information is quite difficult to ascertain um, and it's an important or critical bit of information that measures from what I've, un what I've understood, and Rebecca, you can step in, um, it measures the impact between the release point to the coastal waters and um, it would be just great to have those reports to understand firsthand is there any impact. Um, so for councillors around the table, um, Unity Water have a permit under the Environmental Authority and it's that permit that allows them to, um, or, or controls what they can or can't do, there's conditions attached to that. Um, and part of the permit is a condition that um, Unity Water must design and conduct a receiving environment monitoring program um, that looks at the environmental impacts caused by the sewage treatment under the Environmental Authority um, and that's what I'm just requesting if the CEO can um, liaise with Unity Water to provide that information. Yeah, just a capital R there, Kath, in the receiving. Capital R in receiving. Oh. Clarifying question is, is council not in receipt of that sort of information? That's right, not at this stage. Okay. Yep, yep. Yeah. It's the sort of early days in our conversations with Unity Water around sharing mm. of water quality data. Mm. And um, we're, we've now confirmed what information mm. they receive and at their seven monitoring sites, how often they do that and, and what parameters they're monitoring for. Um, we also have been able to share with them what we record in terms of uh, recreational water quality monitoring and trying to develop a closer partnership around that, that information sharing. So yeah, we can certainly make the request and it will be for them to decide what information they're able to disclose and we'll be encouraging them to share what they can. Very good, thank you. Yeah. Excuse me Mr Chair, we've gone into the specifics of one of the elements of uh, 
that was proposed here. Can we get an overview from staff on the uh, on the matter before us? Sure, we can jump in. Um, uh, the oh, Amy. <coughs> Welcome, Amy. Can you hear us? Hi there. Yes, I can. Perhaps you could give us a bit of an overview of, of your report, please. Some of the key key factors, please. Sure. So as um, Rebecca alluded to, we've been undertaking a um, significant program of work trying to better engage Unity Water, understanding that there's been tensions, I think, in the past. Um, so we went out um, and uh, visited all the different monitoring sites with um, Scott Lowe from Unity Water, and obviously we've had the briefing um, to Council um, in recent months. Um, <clears throat> we're undertaking an overall investigation of the catchment in collaboration with infrastructure and healthy land and water, providing advice as well. And we've got significant interest, I think, from our Bush Care Program um, and New State Integrated Catchment Association in restoration works in the area. Um, I'll defer to um, Larry to talk about the prioritisation project which is proposed with regards to erosion. <coughs> Larry, you've been summoned. <laughs> Please <laughs> come and join us at the table, Larry. <coughs> okay, thanks, Amy. So, uh, through you, Mr Chair, the, um, we have got a proposal from my infrastructure team to, to look at the erosion along all of the, the outlets and outflows of all the all of the creeks through um, uh, through our, our region, through our, our shire. That has come to uh, PCG, I think. I don't think it came to the CWE, but it's 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 a it's a two hundred thousand dollar piece of work. What we've come to a <laughs> position is that we've we're already doing work on on a couple of these or a number of these anyway. Um, so barring what what comes of the result of this this piece of work, then we can we can bring this back to the table in terms of whether we want to continue and do some more work. So we're already doing the Adam Street Ross Crescent. We've got a fair bit of work going on there. We've done repair works and we're monitoring that. We're monitoring Burgess Creek to a to a degree in terms of of the, the outflow and the beach, uh, and as to what we do there going forward. But that's really just the outflow and the and the erosion side of things. So it's mm -hmm. an infrastructure really focused. Um, piece of work um, and I think the the other one we, we're looking at the one at the north end of, of Sunshine as well but it's the whole range that we are looking all, over, all, all through um, but to do them in, in, in much more detail is, a, is the proposal is about $200,000 worth of work so we've got that potentially there if we want to we want to take it forward but it's a piece of work that we haven't budgeted for in this particular year so we're, we're, we're just holding that and we're saying well let's look at this piece of work and see where we go so just to clarify you mentioned creeks which you're referring to as the stormwater outlets and how they enter the creek system and and how that water is all yeah impacting yeah. downstream any that's environmental right. impacts that, uh, that occur as a result right. of that yep yeah, what complicates the creeks too and the outflow areas is pedestrian access and this is the case for a few of them but in particular Burgess Creek and um, where we have informal accesses to as people are making their way down to the beach. Um, we, we need to investigate that and understand how we can use nature-based solutions to minimise the impacts upon the dunes. Um, as a result of that, how we still allow for public access and but at the same time protect environmental values. So that's a key component of the recommendation here as well to do that investigation. My thoughts would have been that that's sort of been our eastern beaches management plan would have uh, would have uh, addressed all of those issues with uh, access and, uh, and consolidating access points and uh, uh, any air incursions. Isn't that what the Eastern Beaches Management Plan, uh, Foreshore Management Plan, is supposed to uh, address. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's it's it's quite broad in its scope, but one component is the beach access, and we've been able to secure some funding to do some standard drawings of the different types of beach accesses along the eastern beaches, and um, and then moving towards some recommendations for improvements. So will this become an element of that Foreshore Management Plan? 
Yeah, that, that foreshore management plan provides some high level guidance and helps to prioritise what management actions are required for eastern beaches. We then need to go to that extra level of determining what that looks like for each of the loca locations. So that's what the grant funding will help us do. And this is the element that I'm, uh, uh, I'm getting to. So this is going to determine when man should intervene with actions as opposed to when nature's, nature's left to its own devices. Yeah, yeah, there's some interesting science around Burgess Creek in the way that the creek mouth meanders to the north and the south, depending on what's happening with storm activity and the volume of water coming down Burgess Creek. Um, so we, we've got some projects um, with our local universities um, that are helping us with the monitoring um, of that creek behaviour and to, um, in particular, look at how uh, different storm events um, wave activity and volumes of stormwater down the creek influence the way the, the creek behaves, how that also contributes to the erodibility of that um, beach area as well. So that monitoring and investigation work will be really important for informing the management actions that come because the works that we're doing at the moment are always only temporary. We can do a straightening of the creek alignment and that helps solve things for a couple of months and then we're finding that the creek meanders back to the north and starts eating into the dune again on the northern side. So this will determine where and if more permanent infrastructure is required to continue to uh, prevent erosion and or guide the, uh, the, the outflows? Yeah, I think we have to look at all the options that are available. The Coastal Hazards Adaptation Plan calls, um, calls for nature-based solutions to be yeah, used I, as I should much have said as possible. If, I should have said if in there, sorry, not throw. Thank you. Because yeah. I, I was thinking nature-based solutions, thank you. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm actually after, is whether there's nature-based solutions being considered as part of this, thank you. Yeah, that, yeah that's right. right. So in terms of when we're thinking about this, we talked about the, the ONS doing the analysis of that behaviour. Our chap identifies the public infrastructure that also Burgess said is a very high risk. I think it's the first place in public infrastructure that's likely to be impacted. Are we looking at what we currently do in the light of that as opposed to in the light of the temporary nature of, as you say, straightening? I suppose it's about how do we put in context in terms of on-ground management, the long-term risk of public infrastructure. Yeah, um, we've learned a lot through the Coastal Hazards Adaptation Project. It's um, helped to inform um, priority ask, um, actions around on-ground work as well as what um, further information we need to find out about, about the way the, the beaches behave. Um, so some of our actions are quite specific around where we need to start improving upon existing infrastructure and then others are more in a monitoring sense or in that nature-based solution sense of trying to build the resilience of our dunes in a, in a natural way, like through bush regeneration. So it's, um, the CHAP's informing all parts of the Council's program, but in an infrastructure sense we're liaising um, weekly with our infrastructure guys around what are appropriate solutions that consider the mapping and the risk assessments of the chat. I'm happy to move. I know you've moved. Mm. 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 Anyone else wish to speak to the motion? I'll, I'll speak to I haven't spoken to the motion. Oh, you were just explaining the motion. I was just explaining the oh, no change. I don't think you have motion. Oh, okay. Um, Okay, um, I'm going to be a little bit blunt. Um, I waited three months for this report and I've got to say I was a little bit disappointed. Through the check, please. Through the check, excuse yes. me, a little bit disappointed. Um, what's happening at Burgess Creek, and I really want to make this about Burgess Creek, not about, you know, eastern beaches. This is about Burgess Creek. My, my notified motion was raising an issue that I thought was an environmental matter that was happening over at Burgess Creek. Um, it's, I, I was expecting, and maybe I was expecting too much, but I wanted this matter to be treated with urgency and real conviction, and I don't feel that the report 
and this is my opinion, is supported by real conviction. The motion that I brought to Council on the 16th of June raised residents' concerns about the damage that was happening at Burgess Creek foreshore shore, and concerns regarding the discoloration of the creek flow and their environmental impacts on our coastal systems, ecosystems. The residents believe that the treated wastewater and the stormwater flowing out of the creek was a health risk and is threatening oh, public infrastructure. Sorry. And when I go to the links that are provided in the report to Council's dedicated website, um, you know, Council's own links actually s support that, that there is a risk. Um, it's my opinion that the report understates the link between stormwater and constant sewage treatment plant effluent to discharge into Burgess Creek as the major cause of the erosion that's happening at Burgess Creek. It's my opinion that the report overstates foot traffic as a primary cause of erosion. The report fails to provide what I requested, which was data and information. Unity water figures on the amount of wastewater discharge, the actual amount of stormwater being discharged into the creek, evidence and footage that the footage entering the creek is in fact naturally occurring tenants. This, I'm quoting this straight out of the report that I've brought to Council. The warning sign, creek water contains treated sewage effluent. My question was how much effluent? What are acceptable levels? I accept that in the recommendation, C covers a lot of what I've, uh, what I've asked, but I'm disappointed that I've now got to still wait maybe a month, another two months or three months to get that report. Where is this information? Why is it not been provided? Um, again, disappointed. To me, we can't fix a problem unless we understand or investigate the cause. Um, how much controlled treated wastewater and how much uncontrolled, untreated wastewater is flowing into Burgess Creek, into our oceans? What is permitted levels under the Environment Authority? And are these levels good enough or are they best practice? We've just heard from our governance um, director um, and we've just ratified our council's risk management appetite journey. And I'm going to quote on page 59 of our general report in, re in regards to council's risk appetite statements in regards to the environment, it states, Council will not tolerate activities and practices that knowingly compromise the environment, are reasonably foreseeable and preventable. Yet, in my opinion, I feel that this is what we're doing. We're tolerating activities and practices that potentially are compromising the environment and that are reasonably foreseeable and preventable. And, and maybe the answer is because it's illegal a, a, a and it's a permitted use. So, so let's just not stop at that. Maybe it shouldn't be illegal and permitted use. Maybe the environmental practice that was okay 20 years ago is no longer relevant. The issue at Burgess Creek has not gone away. I was there a week ago. I notified staff about a month and a half ago that it's starting all over again. Reprofiling the beach and sand, that's a band-aid solution. It's not gonna stop the problem. Foot traffic at the mouth of the creek and liaising with bush care volunteers, it's not going to stop the problem. Because the problem, in my opinion, is caused primarily by the constant discharge of treated wastewater and stormwater to Burgess Creek. Again, if what's happening is permitted, then we need to question, is it environmentally best practice? I will support the recommendation in front and I look forward to the information requested in C um, to be coming to council as soon as possible. I just think as a council, we should be leading in environmental best, best practices um, and we should be doing what sets us apart from other local councils and that's been, that's been different by nature. Um, thank you. Maybe a point of clarity. Yeah. 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 Um, can if, if I can just make some brief comments. 
Um, council staff do treat this matter very seriously. Uh, it's taken some time to be able to gather together the information we think is important for informing an ongoing conversation on this. There's lots of interrelated issues around stormwater management, sewage treatment plant, um, erosion matters, uh, infrastructure planning and delivery that all need to be carefully integrated and considered. Um, the conversations we've been having with Unity Water have been really constructive. In the last three months, we've come a long way in understanding some of the history and legacy issues related to the sewage treatment plant, um, the management processes and their ongoing planning. And the water matters process that Unity Water is, um, is going through at the moment with their water matters plan is a really important first step towards future planning for, for Burgess Creek. Um, it's helping to set some clear objectives and options and, and uh, management actions for the future. Um, they're well aware of community concerns around stormwater outflow, around water quality, around recreational swimming and um, concerns in that regard. Um, and it's, we, it, need, it takes time to work through some of these things. Um, but just so you know that um, council officers are um, working with Unity Water closely every week and that there will be a round of consultation around February next year where the community will be able to be involved in a, a discussion around the water matters process. What council staff had asked of Unity Water is that we slow the process of um, finalising an implementation plan for the Water Matters Plan because we wanted there to be more fuller community engagement um, um, through the process. So they've agreed to slow at that um, process until we've had some sort of a community forum established where there can be an input um, back at the point of looking at a range of options, you alluded to some there, um, that the community can be part of that conversation of talking through those options. So that's all still to come early in the new year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Look, um, yeah. thank you for that, Rebecca. And as a chair, I never apologise. There was a, a point of order I could have called there's councillors cannot impugn improper motives to staff or councillors around the table. And the accusation of a lack of conviction does qualify as one. Is there anything you'd like to say? Um, apologies. I'm, I'm frustrated. I, I want things to happen now, so I mm -hmm. apologise if that's how it came across, mm -hmm. Rebecca. Okay. And, no. and through the Chair, Council Morrison, you know, please note that the data that you're requesting is not Council data. Um, we can't provide you something we don't have, um, but we will do everything we can to provide reporting. But um, you're requesting specific information that Council is not the holder thereof. We can only request, we can only ask for, but the team have in very much the, the highest level of um, their professionalism and in good faith, put this report to council with all available information that we have available and uh, we'll continue to work with you on this matter. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Through the, chair, through the chair, if I could just add to that, yes, the mean. request was made. The request was made to Unity Waters some weeks ago for that data. Hence why we are elevating it to the council level um, for, for a formal um, process. Um, also just wanted to add that we've um, had a very constructive um, workshop with our NRM stakeholders regarding our integrated water quality monitoring program. And we've been working closely with environmental health staff as well to make sure we can get that um, water quality data out there into the public domain in a more transparent fashion. Thank you. Tom, you had a question you wanted to speak? Um, well, first of all, I, I congratulate um, Councillor Lawrence on this because when it comes to pollution and it comes to the sewage and waste treatment, we have to be the squeaky wheel. Um, I guess I'm speaking to this. Uh, second, uh, we're, we're, three, ten, three, oh, yeah. Yeah. we're we're ten percent um, owner in Unity Water, Unity Council. Four point four point five. Four point five percent. So we oh, oh <laughs> we, yeah. We so we yeah, so we're uh, and so my, my question to the, the CEO is um, what if Amelia feels this way, what can she do as a counselor? Where are the bounds that a counselor can just step in and say, All right, this is what I, I want these answers. You know, the staff is busy. They got their own things going on, and if it's a personal thing that they want to do, this. What are the bounds that, that a counselor 
can do to get information from you to the water as a councillor, not as a through, through the chair, Councillor Wigner, and responding exactly what Councillor Lawrence is doing now, um, bringing it to the council table um, to then have what can be resolved upon as a, as a all council position that can be taken forward to Unity Water. Councillor Lawrence, though, as a, uh, as a as a public citizen, um, can request information from Unity Water as, as anybody can. Um, but as a council law, unless it's a resolved position of the council, the council council law could not go to Unity Water and say, um, I'm councillor of this particular area or I'm councillor um, with my surname, you need to give me this information because I am a council law. Um, that, that is not the appropriate way to go about it. So um, Council Lawrenson and the work that Council Lawrenson is doing is the appropriate way to be able to request a report to be brought to the council table. Council officers have provided a report. Councillor Lawrence and part of what officers have put forward is the recommendation with a slight amendment um, is, is now the motion on the floor asking for further information is the appropriate mechanism to be able to undertake and, and we will then continue to work with Unity Water. Um, but that is the process. The power of any individual councillor is on the resolved position of the entire table. Um, but to be a council law without a resolved position of the council going and requesting information, um, that would not be appropriate. Okay. Brian, you had a question? No, I was going to talk to the motion. Oh, you may speak to the motion. Can I just... Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just as, as late as this morning, I met with my equivalent in Unity Water as well to to, to request these these um, this information. He's he's agreed to do that, so at least we've got that happening at that level. Right. It's a multifaceted issue, and, and as I said at the time, when Councillor Lawrence uh, raised this, it's a, a, a total capture manager and a capture manager approach that's needed. Um, I think we do need to divorce the regulatory water quality controls from councils responsibilities to broader catchment management and it's really important to understand that the state licenses community water uh, for its discharge and there is online resources to tell you what that license says and if they've been breached etc 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 it's useful to get their monitoring data to inform uh, because you know, my inquiries several years ago was that uh, nitrogen levels is higher coming from the urban area than it is from the sewage treatment plant um, it's important to um, not infer causality on the sewage treatment plan for a range of issues. And mm. you know, I'm one of the few people that sit there and have a look at the app for occasionally, the spots on football ground. Uh, the, the, the chances of the level of volume of flow coming out of the sewage treatment having a geomorphic effect on coastal erosion is, in my experience, as a river rehabilitator, very small. Um, the, but, but no, having that as consideration is quite legitimate. For me, when we look at our role, um, it is as staff are saying, building the relationship so that with what public information is available, we make available to the community. It's also building an advocacy role because um, I'll be honest, the, the approach to total water cycle management uh, that has come to the table to us uh, behind closed doors um, would have been a good start 30 years ago. Um, to me, what we should be advocating is a much more significant um, policy or, or strategy to get as much water reuse as possible. Uh, because obviously the, the more you take the, the, um, the flow of treated water out of the creek and back into productive reuse, uh, whether it be in uh, landscaping or other uses, uh, the less that we're going to have a cumulative effect. And I think that's what we're seeing, is a cumulative effect of even though their treatment process uh, is highly effective, um, you, you get the cumulative effects of, of nutrient and, and, um, and it's building up with biomass. So to me, it is a good issue to try and deal with uh, because it's, it has got the, the, we need to understand climate change, we need to understand the the impacts of our urban systems and the fact that you know, we're all contributing to that sewage treatment plant. Um, we need to understand that it's not just point source pollution, it's also the diffuse source from where we wash our cars. Do we do it on the driveway or do we do it on our front lawns? It makes a big difference in water quality. So all these issues that will affect the whole catchment um, need to be considered and say, well, the best action to reduce uh, that impact is this. And 
Yeah. We'll get there, and I, I, I think Councillor Lawrence and Lou's saying she wants to get the best practice, and I think that's the other point that we should all hold up on saying is. Yeah. I'm going to follow on from what Councillor Lawrence has said, and Brian's alluded to uh, to some degree. Why has this morphed into a northern, eastern beaches, creeks, high erosion prioritisation project? Again, that to me sounds like something should come out of uh, out of the um, the beach uh, uh, management plan going forward. We've discussed and we've looked at the catchment as a whole with regard to Burgess Creek and realised that there's more than just the end of Burgess Creek. It's a large catchment. Why aren't we doing a Burgess Creek catchment management plan as a, separate, as a separate perspective, which I think is what Councillor Lauriston uh, alluded to in, in what she was asking. Uh, through the and chair, that, we are. We've begun that process. But that doesn't say that here. So what we should be saying here is that that's what we're doing. The other project should be, we should be doing an Eastern Beaches Creek High erosion, Risk Erosion Project as part of the Eastern Beaches Management Plan. I think we should also be doing a risk erosion and, and stormwater asset management plan and, uh, and erosion all of our creeks and catchments where stormwater is. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm saying that there's more. Is why, there question, what's your question? The question is why has this morphed into something different from what was requested? Yeah. I believe what is we've got before us is part of a different element of council work that's currently underway. That there is a, that are now under, understanding that there is a work around a Burgess Creek catchment management plan. I believe there are, that, that there's scope to go even one step further. Is that something that we're looking into with regard to all of the potentials there and not specifically a Burgess Creek catchment plan? Because it starts at, it starts at the well, judgment. Let the staff answer the question. Yeah, so the... Um what the motion was calling for was a detail around um, four or five different management issues and council staff wanted to ensure that uh, all, all of those were addressed within the report, including the various program areas that relate to each of them. Um, and so it, it crosses into various areas, as I said before, around council business. In terms of um, that broader catchment management plan for Burgess Creek, that is embedded within um, the Water Matters Plan as something that will be developed in partnership with Unity Water. Um, we know there's management issues relating to the sports field, um, relating to the way that um, stormwater is managed across the catchment and the urban area. Um, and that um, needs to come before council as, um, as a project as well for, for budget for that. Um, linked in with that is some very specific uh, areas that need close attention and design around the coastal creeks. So this is really highlighting, the first part of the recommendation is highlighting that there's a specific prioritisation project that needs to be done in the short term to be able to address these immediate erosion issues. But stepping back from that, there's also a broader catchment uh, management planning process that needs to be done in conjunction with Unity Water and that is embedded in the Water Matters process but it, we're working through that process over the next few months. So that enable one more step beyond that is to look at all catchments and all stormwater outflows into all creeks with regard to erosion management in the long in the longer term. Talking about the beaches, sir. No, I'm talking about the I'm talking about the entire shire because the issue of um, erosion from stormwater and stormwater runoff as the urban area increases continues to be a problem not only there but uh, as flood management and uh, and flood mitigation measures uh, uh, as well so absolutely so that, sorry through you yeah. Mr. Chair. That, that's that's the work that we're proposing my guys downstairs are proposing to do across all of the creeks in terms of what erosion what the what the the damage and potential mitigation of that damage is mm. um but it all as, as beck said it feeds into this whole much bigger Exercise. That's what I'm alluding to. We, 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 we're yeah. looking at a bigger body of work yeah. ultimately. Yeah, we can do, we can do Thank you. spot yeah. fixes, but yeah. you know, they're fixes. It is, it is a very complicated issue. She brings up the speed with the work uh, is the Department of Environment and Science uh, doing some work around the Mount Burgess Creek and, and Unity, working with Unity Water and having it declared a, uh, as a recreational value zone or something? 
Um, there's um, sort of water quality objectives that are being reviewed at the moment yes. um, by Department of Environmental and Science. For yes. each of the catchment, there's certain water quality standards that need to be met yes. and that are aimed towards as part of um, catchment management activities. Yes. And so they are under review and Burgess Creek is one of, one of um, those water quality objectives for that creek that's under review. And is there a time frame for when that, the results of that review will be? Yeah, delayed? it has been delayed somewhat where staff are, yeah, yeah. So yeah, staff are in contact yeah. regularly with DES asking for updates on that process. I understand that it's imminent, but mm. um, not yet available. Okay. Yeah. Mm, can I just ask uh, a question? Uh, when you're looking at water quality standards and review across the Shire, does that also include out in Kin Kin and the issues around there with sediment and erosion? Or is that completely different? Um, it's related. Yeah, is it related? Um, I'm not sure if that review relates to not? yeah the whether the through the chair whether the water quality objectives review is linked with with that particular matter you're talking about when we sort of talk about rural sediment and erosion matters. Um, it's it's pro it's broader yeah, does that than that. Oh, does For, it integrate into this review or not? Is that a separate conversation? Yeah, I can't answer that. I'm just, I'm not 100% sure on that. Yeah. Thank you. Brian? Just my recollection of the change to the environmental values, what are called objectives, were mainly down this end of the catchment, and it was mainly um, looking at what are the objectives for streams that are known to be not at the best, high standard. So in terms of Burgess Creek, I think that was one of the ones that was being changed. Mm. There were some comments about the stretch below Lake Broad from memory, and our initial advocacy was we want to keep objectives as high as possible, mm -hmm. but they were trying to make them realistic because they, where they have teeth is, I suppose, is when you, you are conditioning developments to achieve those water quality objectives. And if it's unlikely that a development could comply, then that's when you get... Thanks, that clarifies that question. The other question I have is, sorry if I've missed it, but is there any reference in, in this report or on the, the new and updated web page that... Um, confirms that the, the highest nutrient runoff coming out of Burgess Creek is due to stormwater runoff rather than what's coming out of the sewage treatment treatment plant. Do you have any data on that? Uh, we would do. Um, we would have to get more specifics to be able to, um, to provide you with a complete answer. So is that a starting point for a, 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 a constructive discussion about where's the source of the Where's the highest source of nutrients? Is it the waste treatment plant or is it uh, yeah. the council's right. responsibility of how to manage the stormwater? I think it's a bit of both. Yeah, 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 I think it needs to come from both ends. Um, yes. I think that we can continue to have discussions with Unity Water about aiming towards best practice for uh, management of the stormwater treatment plan as part of future upgrades. Um, and then also within our own remit to work towards better um, best practice for catchment management as well, whether it's relating to our um, bioretention basins, uh, how we manage our stormwater within our urban area, um, the sports fields and the like. So, so all, all those sort of diff diffuse um, pollutant sources that, um, that Councillor Stockwell talked about, uh, we, we need to make sure that we're, we're aiming high as well um, so that we can manage it in combination with Unity Water and the, that we're informed about where these pollution sources uh, are coming from. Can you talk a bit more about the work being done to identify the sources of stormwater inflow into the Burgess Creek catchment and some of the solutions that's been, that are being are likely to be implemented? Okay. Uh, through the chair, um, we did take a sample at the Kuya Street Biobasin. Um, I'll have to circle back and check on the outcomes of that. It was only a one-off. But we are trying to, through um, developing this catchment action plan, understand where the point sources of pollution uh, in the catchment might be. And obviously the Unity Water data is, is a key part of the puzzle there. How, how long do we think it might take before we've got some further information with regard to uh, progressing that catchment management plan? Um, Sorry, go ahead, Beck. Sorry, I was uh, through the chair. Uh, we're working with our infrastructure staff to develop up a scope at the moment um, to determine what elements need to be um, looked at in detail. 
Um, so I, I think it's a it's a little bit early days. So, so um, work, in, work in progress just... Uh, work in progress for the next couple of months until we're just a little bit uh, firmer on, on what it will involve. Um, we need to re review our infrastructure within the area. We've, we've got some upgrades that need to be done to our, um, um, our detention basins and look at what options are available for the sports field. Um, is this, a, yeah, a little so bit of that scoping all the elements and, and how all those places fit yes. in the puzzle. Yes. And, and as Amy said, looking at the water quality data, um, now that uh, we're working towards uh, being able to share what water quality data is available across the agencies, that will be really important for informing uh, the next steps. Question yeah. yeah, so one more question. Are we including the digital hub in this discussion or the, the, the memory was one of the, the data that was saying that the, the eastern tributary was, had nutrient problems was uh, chlorophyll A, which is a fairly common indicator. And my memory is that chlorophyll A can be remotely sensed. And I'm wondering whether we actually conclude in this conversation, the digital hub, to say, well, is this part of our broader digital monitoring network? That we actually test this, we can maybe compare, compare water, you know, automatic water sampling or, bit or remote sense stuff uh, in fire areas versus non fire areas, for example, and, and see what happens there. So, through the chair, yes, we have um, been discussing um, remote sensing stations with the digital hub and working closely with James Uliate to um, look at what a public dashboard might look like for yes. those results so that that is progressing and it was a key consideration as part of our water quality monitoring workshop that was held a couple of weeks ago. Um, so part of the previous report I talked about a catchment, a, um, a, a, a catchment committee and a catchment strategy. Um, are you considering forming a Burgess Creek catchment committee? So whilst I've been in this space um, I've come in contact with, like the DMP actually, just there is so much local expertise in this area, people that have worked from Bondi to Brisbane City Council to other councils, will there be an opportunity for external stakeholder committee, Burgess Creek committee, advisory group, um, and is that, is that something that you're thinking of, Rebecca? Yeah, through the chair, I think it's a really good idea and I'm glad that you raised it in um, some recent discussions with Unity Water as well because they were really receptive to that idea and they had had something in mind as part of developing up the next phase of consultation for Water Matters to have a Burgess Creek specific advisory group Thank committee. You. So um, they're really keen to progress something like that um, early in the new year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anybody else wish to speak to the motion? No. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'd like to thank the staff for the report. Thank you, Councillor Lawrenson, for bringing the notified motion, which has provided uh, a wealth of information about the, the complex nature of uh, factors that are at play in regards to um, the Burgess Creek catchment. I'm particularly interested in things that are directly within Council's control, and that is um, the stormwater management. Uh, and if we can do better manage our stormwater uh, in flowing into the, the Burgess Creek, um, that's all for the better. Um, I'm interested in um, getting more information, more facts, so that we can have a, uh, as a basis for a constructive discussion around what the problem is in the first place, and uh, if there is a, uh, and how we best address that. And also, uh, the results of this review that's underway with the Department of Environment and Science, which I understand may require Unity Water to upgrade its water treatment um, processes there. So thanks, I thank the staff for the great report. I do, I much rather have you take the time, self take the time to provide a, a comprehensive and factual report than, um, than rush anything as important as this. So, um, again, thank you. Mm. Joe? Yeah, that, that, I'll agree with that, Frank. I mean, said, uh, it does, um, uh, the realisation that, uh, that Burgess Creek catchment is quite a large catchment and has a significant number of, uh, of elements and impacts that, uh, that flow into it. And that uh, uh, I'm glad to hear that staff are saying that we are working on a, uh, with Unity Water on an overall 
uh, overall catchment management or uh, at least a review and a management plan to, to go forward because uh, because of elements like tannins that flow in and that uh, people see as uh, incorrectly as uh, a sewage outfall and the like and, uh, and understanding the elements and uh, uh, the length and breadth of, uh, of where these tannins can also flow in from. So, but uh, you know, an important element of this is also unity water, so it's good to have them, them on board as a, a partner in this, remembering that we also get some water rate flows from all across uh, the residential area that mm -hmm. flows into this and including the uh, the commercial precinct of, uh, of Noosa Junction. So again, it's a, it's a, it's a large body of water that, uh, uh, and, a, and a lot of tributaries that flow in. So it's a, it'll be a large body of work to uh, to get this all together. And I thank staff for their, mm -hmm. their time on that. It wasn't quite what I understood coming through from the question that had been originally asked uh, of Councillor Morrison and that we had focused on, on the beaches element of it, so I'm glad to see that we've got that, the remainder of the catchment in, uh, in consideration for, uh, for an action management plan. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, can I just make a comment? Yeah. I just think that any work that contributes um, to water quality is most beneficial. Water is life, and if we are not focused on the quality of our water, you know, that well, where will we be without that? So I want to thank the staff and for you know the collaborative approach, you know throughout the shire and the conversations we've had here today. I think we're all in agreement that this is a really important issue. So I want to just thank everyone for their contribution. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I want to thank Councillor Lawrence for bringing this to the table. Um, it's a very important issue, and also thank staff. Um, this is there's a lot of work to this. It's it's breadth is wide and mm -hmm. deep, um, and it'll be ongoing. Um, there is the opportunity that um, I think Scott, you and myself have both met with the new CEO of Unity Water. Um, so there's certainly, um, and she was very supportive um, and our initial meetings were very positive. So there is the ability to expedite this uh, too at that level as well um, going forward. So we'll keep that in mind. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Firstly, apologies. Um, thank you for clarifying. Like I said, when I got the report, I thought, you know, what I asked for, what hasn't been delivered, so please accept my apologies. Um, I think when I entered this space, I think the questions that I think need to be answered are two or three questions. Are we okay with unity water discharging stormwater and treated sewage in our creeks and beaches? Question one. Um, are we okay with the current practice? Um, or is that environmental practice no longer relevant? Question two. And if it's okay, and the water quality has met recycled water quality criteria, then we should really be having a serious conversation about reusing that water. Um, in a few weeks, I'll be going to the LGAQ conference in Cairns and hopefully presenting a motion that will help support what we're doing here in Noosa in this space at Burgess Creek. Um, a motion is going to be presented um, that will lobby state into investing and investigating additional um, uses for treated or um, wastewater. So um, again, environmental best practices um, will need to be different by nature and this may be a really great legacy or opportunity for, for us here in Noosa Shire Council. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. The motion has in favour. That's unanimous. Thank you, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, 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 Thanks,
from waste utility charges and general rates uh, with uh, discounts to allowed less than forecast. Um, 314000 from interest revenue, which is higher due to the investment in high yielding term deposits that we mentioned previously. Uh, $160,000 from waste disposal fees, $131,000 from holiday park revenue, and $131,000 from uh, operating grants. Our operating expenditure is $263,000 under spent year to date, with $21,000 of that relating to employee costs, and the balance uh, $342,000 relating to materials and services. Our capital re revenue remains on track at this stage. Um, however, our capital expenditure is by behind budget, and this is due to the profiling of the infrastructure program. So the team is still working on that and ironing out exactly the timing of those projects. So that will probably improve in the next month or so. <coughs> um, Council is currently holding $114 million in our cash reserves, and that's at its peak given that we've just collected the rates run uh, in August. Um, with interest rates continuing to rise, we have invested a further $10 million in high yielding term deposits, so that's a total of $40, $40 million in term deposits at this stage. Um, overall, we are continuing to track well and uh, a good start for the beginning of the year. Thank you, Pauline. Questions? Yeah. Claire. Thank you, Pauline. Um, always a very good report, <laughs> thank you, and I know how busy you guys are, so we appreciate it. Yeah. Um, just just to confirm, and I think you've talked about it, the 14 um, months, page 78 of the agenda. Um, yeah, we're well and truly over that um, three months Correct. requirement. Yep. Yeah. And, and, but, but because of, I guess, uh, upcoming expenses, ongoing expenses, that will come back? Correct. Um, yep. Yes. The so net, is, yes. I was just going to say, we are working on bringing you a dissection in future months reporting that will actually break that out, what we're holding in restricted reserves for disaster management, uh, we all, whether we're holding it for the waste levy subsidy. So that will kind of provide a little bit more clarity around what's actually sitting in those reserves down right. track. Thank um, you. Net financial liabilities ratio, negative 118%. Um, targets less than 60%. Can you just talk me through that? So essentially that means in terms of our financial position, we have quite a substantial borrowing capacity. Um, the assets far outweigh our liabilities. Yeah. So if we were needing to do a major project, then we were in a good position to approach the bank to, to fund that if we needed to. Great, thank you. And rates are in arrears. Uh, they're higher than projected, but that is normal for this time of year. Correct, so, so we're yep. at the highest point in the cycle. So we'll yep. see that come down over the next few months. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you. That's all I have. Thanks. Now, um, um, our return on investment graph's gone over to the right far more than it has been in the last two years. I take it that's because we're investing back into one of the big four. Correct. Correct. Now, I know we have to go there in terms of our financial sustainability risk type appetite. A while back, we were looking at where we invested with a view to this corporate so social responsibility how many of the big four are actually doing the right thing in terms of their investment in uh, things that might be adding to climate change, etc. Have we got that data and are we still making we, our decisions? We, uh, well, in terms of the decision making, we assess across a range of different um, institutions, so it's not just the big four, we do approach lower levels as well and we look at the yield on those. Uh, I, there, there is not a robust form in terms of assessing the sustainability of the investments. I know that some of the big fours are doing work on there. We're not quite sort of there in terms of um, what we. I think the policy might allow for us to accept a slightly lower yield, but the products are sort of limited in terms of where we're at, at the moment. But the rates are starting to move at this stage, so we will do some more investigation. Yeah, I just think because yeah. it's going to be a competitive market going forward, there now mm -hmm. the time. It's, I presume still the majority of that forty million. All I know is, is still with uh, QTC. QTC, which is. So the, the 40 they, million, they yeah, well, yeah. the bulk of our funds is with QTC, but 40 million is split between uh, oh, CBA yeah. and NAB. Okay, know. so that's quite a substantial investment too. Correct. that We should be exercising our ability to influence yeah. as much as possible. Mm. Yeah, that was my question. That we are—it's not just we're, we're we're split over three, aren't we, Paul? Yeah, the so three. QTC, CBA, yeah. Yeah. and we do it. We like, as I said, we approach other banks and institutions, so it's not just the big four that we get rates yeah. from. Um, we, we did look at the yield amount in Correct. So we can do the smaller, smaller amounts, and we did look at doing that as well. Forty million might seem like to us, but to a big bank, it's the drop in the ocean. No, but you never know. Depends on the borrowing capacity. And, yeah. and I was going to raise the same point that Brian raised: the investment return currently two point six three percent. Correct. Keep yep. going. 
If that's, if that's the one with interest rates rising on that side, <laughs> <laughs> <It's a legend. laughs> Yeah, we, d we just need to manage our cash flow and our, our pro projections given that we need to bring those cash in so that the last lot of investments is on a shorter, shorter term um, so that we make sure we have sufficient cash to fund yeah. our capital program and operation. Yeah. Okay. I have a question um, on page 73. You mentioned employee costs. Yeah. Year to date, under extended of the term of staff salaries and wages, 354,000 due to vacancies. Can we, do you have an idea of how many position vacancies that actually is? Uh, I, I don't. I can take that on notice and, and bring that information back to you. Um, but obviously, a lot of that is filled with labour hire and um, some casual employees as well. Partially offset stage. by labour yeah. hire. 117 for partial mm -hmm. offset by labour hire. It'd be good to know how many. Well. The, the man they should know, that's sitting right next to you. Yeah, we, we've just gone to the market with um, 15 positions that we're recruiting to at the moment, um, based on what we would normally have, and it, it's, a, it's a figure sitting between 80 to 100 vacant positions, um, mm -hmm. and that, that's across casual attempts, permanent contract. Um, so yeah, we are um, definitely recruiting as much as we can. Mm -hmm. We'll see a positive result on the side of the ledger, the negative is the, the extra um, pressure that puts on current staff within the business to be able to deliver that workload. Mm. So there's, yeah, um, while it's positive in relation to expenditure, there, there is that other issue. We're working on that, but um, we're not alone. Um, yeah. It's a big message in mm. that local government across the country now, I'm attending the LGMA last week, um, all councils are struggling in this space. and. Uh, it's something where we now really, as a sector, need to start to look at as to where our future plan is going to come from, our parks and garden staff, our waste yeah. staff. Um, there are extreme difficulties and pressure points and, and there are parts of the local government makeup that are more difficult than others. Um, Aging population, particularly within the local government sector, um, we're seeing um, quite a large number, not just um, day-to-day -day, um, executive ranks, all reaching retirement age. Um, so we will see some major changes across the sector over the 25 years. Um, we're working on it, remuneration and benefits are, are key. Yeah. So that's a big component of the discussion with the executive and we'll bring that back to the council. Mm. We, we, we can't just fix this with throwing more money at people. It's gotta be all about is the culture of where we work, um, what we stand for, what other non um, non monetary benefits that we can provide as a council to our staff, and then ultimately, of course, there's the cash component of remuneration. Mm. But our HR team are working on, on all of that now, so that you know, it, it, this is different by nature and a great place to work. But what, what would be the uh, sorry, no, no, really. what would be the, um, the, the current ideal full time equivalent staff number? Is it 500? Oh, sorry. Well, no, what's, sorry, what's the staff number, including casuals, that we need 500 plus? 500, just on 500 for us, that includes the casual component. <laughs> FTE is about 380, um, so about 120, um, and that's because of the, the diversity of business that we run across pools, galleries, libraries, so that, that casual component works for us in a way that we can provide a, a broader depth of services over um, outside that nine to five period. So mm -hmm. 380 is the full-time that, that's correct. So what would be, so we're down 100 in mm. terms of casuals and everything else. Mm. If, if you had to um, condense that into a full-time equivalent, how many are we down in terms of full-time equivalent? I'd say probably about 50. 50? Yep. Okay. Yep, that's where we're at right now. Yes. Yeah. Um, starting, we're seeing a trend though um, of uh, jobs that did go to the market that we're getting very few of any applicants we're seeing more applicants come through no, that's good um so we think as well that there is um still growth in the economy people are looking for safe harbor with our employment and they know that government can provide that um so we are seeing more applicants coming through higher level of quality um, our difficulties in noosa are going to be very much um, about affordability so we might be able to attract through a degree of remuneration, benefits, culture, what we stand for, um, if they can't find somewhere to live. These mm. are the issues that we're yeah. going to be facing. So my maths isn't that good, it's on the top of my head, so 50, can you get 380, is that a, like a 7 or 8%? Yeah, we're, we're sure yeah. Full -time yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Low floating between that um, 7 to 15% mm. at any given time because it is fluid and moves. 
Um, but yeah, that would be fair to say that you know we're averaging probably around about that eight percent mark that um, are sitting vacant. And while that works on the balance sheet, we want that to provide the services. Yes. Yeah. 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 Just just to correct, fifty out of three eighty is fifty. 30%. Fifty out of five hundred was ten percent. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's, but it's, um, yeah, it's it's difficult. The other side of that coin, Mr. CEO, of mm. course, is the fact that um, backfill positions, permanent positions that you know, that, that aren't filled, certainty for positions and, and the like, mm. would also help facilitate staff retention. Yes, staff retention is always a concern. Yes. Um, so those you know, expediating those uh, uh, those uh, filling of those positions or. Um, uh, particularly those purchases that have gone uh, 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 would be a priority for you? Yes, it, it is through, through the chair. Uh, October, um, the conversion of um, longer term casual and temporary employees will be put to the council um, to be converting to full time employees. So, uh, following on from the recent presentation by each of the directors in that area, um, we'll also address our structure as well, too, whether the structure is addressed in October or November. We will be doing that, but we, we have a, a lot of high-level staff that are sitting in acting roles. Um, Pauline, case in point. Um, that's, that's what I'm referring so to. We, that was what we'll we'll be correcting. Um, so trying, to, trying to fix it, Pauline. Uh, <laughs> okay. casual, casuals and temps um, will go to the October round of meetings. Um, most probably we'll go straight to January on that, just because of the gravity that it has for the whole of council, but we'll, we'll work with the team. Um, and whether it is the October round or the November round, um, each of the directors are working on the structure overall. Um, we'll bring that forward for council. So I think we address casuals and temps first, then structure and the acting, um, and then that sets us for a really strong 2023. Thanks, thank, thank you. Anyone care to move the... Um, I'll move it. Move I'll second it. Second to Joe. Um, I have a question. Uh, well, I've got a, we've got a second motion, so... Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Pauline. Look, everything's on track. Um, I think just when my eyes go to sort of those those big differential differentiations, which was was the issues I raised, but there is an explanation um, for them, and, and there's certainly um, justification and reasoning behind it. Um, thank you for a very um, solid um, and informative report, and you know I appreciate that you know you, your job you, at the moment you're understaffed, under resourced. We've just heard that, so. We really take our hats to um, off to your team and all the hard work you do. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, a question and suggestion, Pauline. On page 84, there's a summary of key materials and services expenditure. Yeah. Um, it would be great to have a column with what was budgeted in 2021, 2022. So when I read these numbers, I, I always keep going, how much was it compared to last, last year in terms of legal expenses, in terms of grants page community organisations to just get um, a, a, an idea how much more we So you're looking at budget, what we budgeted versus what we actually spent for last financial year? Um, just to clarify. Uh, your, your recommendation, I think what actually was Spent. Yeah, yeah I, I would probably suggest actuals, actuals but yeah. obviously year on year can be different for different reasons, so just yeah. bear that in mind. Yeah. Actuals, thank you. Mm. Like a trend analysis. A trend just analysis. For a yeah. Just for a reference. Yeah. Anybody else wish to speak? Oh, I just like well, to say that you know, I look forward to the opportunity to uh, drag the finance manager over the coals, but wait till you go to the <laughs> Feel free to do it now, it's fine. <laughs> Mr. CEO, what sort of culture are we trying to create here on the council? <laughs> <laughs> to, um, there's examples of behaviours, that, that's one example that we can utilise. Yeah. But we want to get you very far. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. That's all right, council stock will be dragged over the coals in about March. March, what would you do? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. 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 May I still use the coals? No. Okay, all, all good. in favour? That's unanimous.